Today, a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee heard testimony from representatives from the Institute for Defense Analysis. Later, National Drug Policy Director Barry McCaffrey and Coast Guard Commandant Robert Kramick testified. The hearing's five and a half hours. Good morning. Hearing of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice will now come to order. We are holding these hearings today to review a study of drug policy, a study we believe to have significant findings prepared by an independent group, the Institute for Defense Analysis, at the request of Secretary of Defense Perry in 1994. Basic findings of the study were submitted to the Office of National Drug Control Policy in early 1996. And while efforts were made to take some conclusions out of this study, the final draft was created in May of 1996. In terms of background, this subcommittee has oversight responsibility for our nation's drug war and has the utmost respect for our new drug czar, Barry McCaffrey, as well as our nation's interdiction coordinator, Admiral Bob Kramick. In the past, in the course of some 19 hearings uh, that have come before the subcommittee, the subcommittee has questioned for some time the administration's strong reliance on treatment as the key to winning our nation's drug war. And furthermore, this subcommittee has questioned the wisdom of drastically cutting to the bone interdiction programs in order to support major increases in hardcore drug addictive treatment programs. The basis for this change in strategy has been the administration's reliance on the 1994 RAND study, and therefore we need to make sure that in the light of new major trends in increased teenage drug use, that we continue to plan and place our resources where we can get the best results. And I'd also like to mention in terms of cooperation between uh, both sides of the aisle, um, this subcommittee has worked with the Coast Guard in transit zone programs. Uh, we've gone into the transit zone area. We've held hearings in Puerto Rico. Uh, over the past two years, it's accomplished an awful lot of work in refocusing the nation on the importance of the drug war. Our first witness was Nancy Reagan, and uh, she kind of led this effort off, but we've, uh, we've come a long way in getting our nation refocused. Uh, the Speaker of the House asked uh, Denny Hastert and I to go to South America to visit uh, source country programs, uh, Mexico, Panama, Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, take a look at what was working and what was not working and come back and make recommendations to the speaker. And Denny Hastert has worked tirelessly in uh, working with the appropriators and putting the package together. In the last three or four days, we've been able to accomplish uh, an awful lot in, in terms of not only giving the uh, drug czar his much needed staff, but to give him the resources needed to do his job. So it's been a uh, bipartisan cooperative effort. Uh, and again, I believe that uh, it is a major challenge as we face uh, in terms of the future of our country, in terms of the next generation. I don't think there's anything more important, and particularly when you combine crime and drugs. Now, the issue today that we'll be talking about initially, uh, apparently Admiral Kramick, the interdiction coordinator, attempted to brief President Clinton's drug czar, General McCaffrey, on the IDA study in uh, March of 1996 with two of the study's authors. General McCaffrey, whom we've tried hard to support again, and I've indicated our support for him through his complete tenure, uh, which is approximately uh, the last uh, six months, allegedly refused to hear the briefing. This in combination with other events surrounding that refusal has left many of us on the committee troubled and confused. Cooperation is a two-way street and we obviously need to see all the data that comes in, whether it agrees with our philosophies individually or it agrees with others' philosophies. So I think it's very important that we stay on track with all the information that's available out there. We expect to hear testimony bearing on the question of whether the study, which appears to have been highly critical of President Clinton's drug control strategy, was intentionally delayed, altered, or otherwise suppressed. In essence, the study's conclusions are two. First, source country and interdiction programs do work, although they were cut by present administration in 1993, 94, and 95. And second, the RAND study justifying record level funding for drug treatment is seriously flawed. We will hear expert testimony on the study today as well. 
And it's not easy for those of us who have been wor working with and been very highly supportive of both General McCaffrey and Admiral Kramick to be asking some of these tough questions. On the other hand, we feel that it is our responsibility uh, in terms of oversight responsibility of our nation's drug war to make sure that we have everything on the table, everything that we can possibly use in terms of measuring resources. And in our judgment, again, this is our nation's number one problem, and we need to make sure that whatever resources we have uh, give us the best opportunity to win the war on drugs. So as the day progresses, we hope to discover the truth about three things. First, whether this study exists and in what form or forms, since the public does have a right to know its conclusions. Second, whether it is in fact highly critical of the administration's strategy, specifically demonstrating the cost effectiveness of interdiction documenting the failings of the RAN treatment study. And third, whether the study is opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. On the eve of the adjournment of the 104th Congress and exactly five weeks before the election, we are participating in the 18th hearing this subcommittee has held on the important issue of illegal drugs in our nation. Unfortunately, the very title of this hearing, Review of Internal Administration Study, Critical of Clinton Drug Policy and White House Suppression of Study, suggests just another partisan attack on the administration's drug policy shortly before the election. Mr. Chairman, I believe that there are several important points that need to be made. First, the subject of this hearing, a draft report by the Institute for Defense Analysis on the cost effectiveness of interdiction programs is just that. We're having a hearing on a draft. The final report has yet to be issued. Both you and I know that draft reports from many government entities are frequently subjected to reworking after the draft has been circulated for comments. The Office of National Drug Control Policy received a copy of this draft report in May of this year. The ONDCP sent the draft to five independent specialists to conduct peer review analysis. None, and I repeat, none of the five reviewers were paid for their services. In a further attempt to ensure a balanced review, the five reviewers were anonymous, so they could feel free to write what they thought about the IDA report without any chance of outside pressures exerting influence over their findings. Almost all peer reviews conducted by acad academic journals are anonymous. What did the panel reviewers discover? One peer reviewer stated that, and I quote, empirically, the study is flawed by a failure to interpret a number of data series correctly, end of quote. Overall, the panel was unanimous, and I repeat, unanimous, in its conclusion that the IDA report is seriously flawed and is in need of substantial rewrites before the study can be published in final form. Remember, this is a draft study that we are discussing here today. The same one that I just said was unanimously determined to be flawed. The panel of peer reviewers were not the only ones who had problems with this draft study. Officials within IDA itself have expressed concern about the draft report. According to a July 10, 1996 IDA memorandum, Serious questions were raised about the validity of the draft report. For the record, I would like to point out that IDA has made the first three pages of this July 10th, 1996 memorandum available to both the majority and the minority. This memo from Ralph Rechenbach agrees that the methodology in this draft report is flawed. But we're going to have a hearing today on a, on a flawed draft. He states, quote, the only relevant issues are whether or not there are price increases at the retail level and whether these price increases can be correlated in time with specific inter interdiction events. Even if this correlation can be found, additional work must be done to demonstrate a casual relationship." End of quote. Mr. Rockenbach goes on with a detailed analysis of the problems in the study. Mr. Chairman, at this point I ask unanimous consent 
that the July 10th, 1996 memo from IDA be included in the hearing record? Without a Jefferson, so I Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Finally, I am troubled by accusations, accusations from the majority that the administration has, has somehow tried to bury this draft study. During his last, last appearance before us, General McCaffrey, who, by the way, I have the utmost respect for, answered questions about the IDA report and made it clear that, one, he believed the initial draft of this report to be flawed, and two, that neither he nor anyone else in the administration wanted to suppress the report. In, September, on, in, in a September 20, 1996 letter to Chairman Zeliff, General McCaffrey sent the results of the peer review panel, making it clear that if ONDCP had wanted to suppress this draft, he would not have ordered the peer review analysis. Mr. Chairman, every one of us on this panel knows that General McCaffrey's integrity and reputation is above reproach. I am disappointed that General McCaffrey has to appear before us today to answer these unfounded charges of covering up the IDA draft report. I know that General McCaffrey could be spending his time more wisely, much more wisely, in confronting the drug problem. In fact, he could be in my home city of Baltimore, where the drug problem is severe. Mr. Chairman, I admire and applaud your commitment to fighting the scourge of drug abuse in our nation. I repeat my offer to, to you to assist you in any way. However, finding a solution to the drug problem must be bipartisan and free of election year politicking. People are dying. Interdiction is an important component to ending the drug problem. I'm almost finished. I do not oppose introduction programs. However, I must not forget treatment and prevention. As General McCaffrey has stated on numerous occasions, all three of these elements must work together if we are to make real progress in ending the supply of illegal narcotics in the United States. In closing, let me welcome back General McCaffrey and Admiral Kermick. I also look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings, and I'm well aware of your commitment to this very important issue. Um, I will just read the last paragraph of that three pages you just inserted in the record. Having said this, the basic method employed by IDA makes sense to me. If the pattern of price increases holds true and the price series is properly constructed, then the IDA analysis may be very important. Uh, but we will discuss this as we go through the hearing. Uh, I'd like to uh, now turn to uh, Chairman of our full committee, uh, Mr. Klinger from Pennsylvania, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you uh, very profoundly for calling this important hearing. And I want to tell you what I believe, at least, is important in all of this. Two things are important, process and substance. On the process, I've got to tell you that whether or not the IDA, Institute for Defense Analysis Study, is the best study ever done or the worst study ever done is really not the issue. We're going to hear a lot of dispute about the accuracy of the report and the findings of the report and whether or not uh, it deserves to be given uh, credence or credibility. But that really isn't the issue. The, the issue is that it needed and deserved to be part of the debate, part of the discussion uh, as we went into the appropriations process this year. Uh, what matters is that it was a year-long internal administration study. It came to conclusions that were at the very least uncomplimentary of the Clinton drug strategy between 1993 and 1995, and the drug czar, we are told, uh, was unwilling, refused uh, to even take a briefing on the study. Uh, and let me just indicate that it, to me it seems a very flawed uh, process that leads uh, to having the top White House drug policy official and the gentleman for whom, as we've indicated, we all have enormous respect uh, to, for whatever reason, whether from pressure from elsewhere or whatever, uh, to reject out of hand a study on the basis of its conclusions without at least hearing from the distinguished and eminent scientists uh, and PhDs who wrote it. Process point number two. There is a lot of talk going on around uh, here and elsewhere about cooperation now, and I think uh, we would all welcome and applaud uh, cooperation. And, and uh, the fact that uh, we're told the administration wants to cooperate with Congress to restart, because I think we would all agree the war has been in uh, limbo for some time, that to restart the effort to deal with the drug menace of this country. Uh, but I think we really have to make the record very straight. This committee 
this subcommittee has held 19 hearings on drug policy, uh, starting in March of 1995, as Chairman Zellow said, with Nancy Reagan, and this committee has been trying to engage administration on drug policy from the beginning. Uh, this president gave seven major addresses in 1993 and 1994 and mentioned drugs zero times. He gave more than 1,600 interviews and speeches in 1993 and mentioned drugs only 13 times. In 1994, he gave more than 1,700 interviews and speeches and mentioned drugs only 11 times. This is not leadership and this is not really giving the kind of attention to an issue that is, uh, is so deadly and so threatening to the youth uh, of this nation. We went through the whole appropriations process, and this, I think, is what really ultimately uh, my bottom line concerns me, one in which the administration asked for record levels of spending on treatment programs and still has kept introduction below its 1991 and 1992 levels. This study's conclusions would have helped immeasurably to advance that debate, and that at the very least, the conclusions and the recommendations should have been part of that debate. If they could be disproven, if they were found not to be valid, uh, one, that's one thing, but the fact that they weren't even considered, weren't even on the table for discussion is a, is a serious disappointment. Uh, members of this committee have met four or five times with General McCaffrey privately, and I must say that I'm advised that he never once mentioned this study's existence or its conclusions or its recommendations, which would have, I think, confirmed the need or at least suggested the need to reverse the administration's priorities. So this is not cooperation. If we're going to have cooperation now, we're grateful for that, but we have not had in my view, cooperation in the past. We never got a chance when it would have counted to debate this study's merits or discuss openly the seemingly misguided priorities of the White House in 93, 1994, and 1995, and we could have done so effectively with this study on the public record. I think the point is that this study, as in all studies that are done with regard to this menace, need to be a part of the public record, need to be a part of the public debate. The study would have bolstered what the designated interdiction coordinator, Admiral Kramick, wrote to uh, former drug czar Lee Brown in December 1994. He stated then that, and I'm quoting, we must return to 1992-1993 levels of effort in interdiction. Yet no action was ever taken as a result of that uh, warning uh, that uh, Mr. Brown issued at that time. This White House has effectively deprioritized interdiction in order to pump uh, billions into more treatment. Uh, we're not saying that treatment doesn't need to be part of the mix, but I think the imbalance between the resources devoted to treatment and uh, those devoted to interdiction is seriously askew. So the result, direct or indirect, of failed leadership and a failed interdiction strategy has been a dramatic rise. And we've seen the evidence of that in the studies that have come out most recently, the Pride data of last week. Uh, the, the dramatic rise in drug availability and purity, uh, increased use, increased uh, incidence of use, a drop in price, and a frightening increase in use drug abuse. So again, Chairman Zeliff, I want to applaud you and the members of your subcommittee who have been so persistent, so tenacious in pursuing this issue when, frankly, uh, we were not seeing the kind of commitment and the kind of tenaciousness uh, from the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. You've stepped out in front on this issue in a tireless effort to bring about change, and I commend you and all the members of the subcommittee, Mr. Micah, Mr. Hastert, and others who have taken such a great leadership role in this area. Thank you, uh, Chairman Klinger. Uh, another gentleman that I've already mentioned that's uh, done heroic work in terms of uh, the appropriations committees working on behalf of uh, the speaker in terms of assisting the subcommittee as we went to South America and tried to pull the programs together, uh, Denny Hastert from Illinois. Well, I thank the chairman. You know, it's interesting that we come before this uh, as a committee today to ask some important questions about our drug policy. You know, I, I don't view this thing. I'm not a chairman of any committee or any subcommittee, but I've been around this place for 10 years. And I see one of the basest threats to our security, to our children, is drugs in this country. And, you know, I, I guess I wear a couple different hats coming in here. First of all, I come in here as a father, a father that hope my teenage sons don't get embroiled in any type of drug use, that they don't have to go through any types of programs. And I guess I come also into this committee room with the old academic hat of an economist, and I'm that 
an economist with PhDs, but I did my major work in e economics, and I taught economics in a high school for 16 years. And one of the basic things that we talked about in economics are where trends coordinate. Where prices are high, there must be reasons for high prices. When demand is low, there must be reasons for that low demand. Uh, when things disrupt the ordinary process of something coming from market to or from the manufacturing to the final market, there's all kinds of things that can interfere. And I think it's relevant, contrary to the gentleman from uh, on the other side of the aisle from uh, Baltimore, I think it's when you find those disruptions and those parallels, there should be an honest attempt to understand why they happen, not just to gloss them over or just say, well, there's something wrong with the science. When we talk about science in these types of surveys, and you know, sometimes uh, Congress gets so embroiled in studies. And it's right that we do studies. It's right that we understand why things happen and to go beyond just the testimony or the talk that we have going between ourselves in this, uh, uh, on these dies from time to time and the testimony that we get from expert witnesses, but to go out in, in the real world and find out why things really happen. So the other hat that I bring on in, in this thing is somebody who's been asked uh, by our leadership, and I am a part of the leadership, to try to help where we think that there needs to be shoring up, especially in things like appropriations and going out into the source countries and seeing what happens, if there's really uh, uh, real programs going on, if people are doing real things out there to stop. Because when you talk about abstract places, faraway places like the jungles of uh, the Bolivia, or the Amazon Basin of Peru, or the jungles of Colombia, or Panama, or even Mexico. It's something that's beyond most of our experience. We don't know what goes on there. We don't know the cultural situations there. We don't know the reason that campesinos try to make a living for their families, or how they do that. We don't know the interaction of our uh, DEA agents and military and other people who are trying to work with uh, organizations on the ground in those countries. But when you are there and see it and literally see people risking their lives day in and day out on a foreign soil, and some of those being foreign nationals, to try to make life better in this country, then we owe those folks, we owe those people the ability to make sure that they can get their job done and what the priorities of that job should be. So when I go around, and as I have been tasked to do, and talk to the chairman of various appropriation committees and saying, boy, can we get some money into this, this bill so that we can get P3s on the ground or off the ground or into these source countries so that we can see what the drug, flying drug trade is with downward looking radar? Or can we fix some spray planes? in Colombia or in Mexico so that we can deliver uh, insectic or pest, uh, herbicides uh, to this death threat of uh, whether it's uh, poppy fields that uh, create heroin or whether it's uh, the cocaine plant fields that uh, deliver coca and crack to our streets and to our children. And when I find a member, a chairman in my own party, of an appropriation committee that somewhat sanctimoniously uh, th waves in my face a study done by the RAND Corporation a couple of years ago and saying, well, this RAND Corporation study, this RAND study, shows that uh, there, there's no, there's no uh, link at all between interdiction and am amount of drugs on the street. And for that reason, I'm not going to put money in the Coast Guard, or I'm not going to put money in interdiction, because this study tells me something else. And then we find evidence that there's evidence to the contrary. And contrary to my good friend from Baltimore, it's not a draft, it's a final draft. And a final draft that's been denied distribution, because what apparently seems a political purpose, a political purpose that's there to justify 
uh, a policy by the White House long before uh, my friend uh, General McCaffrey ever came to be the drug czar, but to justify something that causes teenage drug use to double, that causes 12th graders to use uh, more drugs that we've ever had uh, used by this uh, population, that is actually poisoning the youth of this country? Come on. We need to get down to all the reasons this happens. And if we have good information that's done on some scientific basis that we can use to justify putting funds into interdiction as well as funds into the demand side, the treatment programs that we have. But it can't and it shouldn't be all one way or all the other. The common sense approach that this Congress has tried to take for the last two years is to find what are the reasons that for things happening, whether it's health care or Social Security or Medicare. And then when we find those reasons, let's apply common sense to that reason and make sure that we have things in place that makes interdiction work, that calls down the cost of drug or that drives up the cost of drugs that holds down demand. So <clears throat> at least maybe 100 or 150 or 200 thousands of our kids can't afford this or it's not within their scope for rec recreational purposes. That kind of makes sense. So let's get the facts out. And there's no place in this Congress or on a partisan basis or in this country to tilt the story one way or the other without really getting to the facts. So I, I welcome this hearing today. I hope we can get down to the facts. I can understand, uh, you know, just some little things we're able to do. For instance, um, we stress that we've worked hard to give this administration what it asked for and more. We put $165 million more in counter-narcotics in the defense bill. And it just happened because the this administration wanted that to happen. We put $20 million more for DEA than the president requested in the first place. But other people say we need to have this. We put $75 million more in DEA agents for the source countries and more in virtually every area that's been highlighted. So we, through the evidence that we found, have tried to help the situation. And we've given the, the drug czar, General McCaffrey, who will be here today, an extra $60 million in discretionary funds so that he can use that money to best decide how he can fight the drug war without politics pulling on them from one side or the other. Now, we also need to find out what works and what doesn't work, where we need to put resources and where we don't need to put resources. And if we can't have honest answers and people bringing forth honest information, then <coughs> shame on us and shame on this Congress. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hastert. I'd just like to quickly um, echo one comment uh, in terms of your opening statement. Um, there was a lot of conflicting evidence on source country programs when we decided to make that trip down there. And, and in a very short six days, uh, we were able to sort out a lot of that conflicting evidence. And working with everybody that's involved in the drug war, we came back with many recommendations, which we discussed with the drug czar. And, and again, both sides of the aisle, and you, in, in your efforts in the last, uh, even to the last three or four days in getting the funding that they need. Uh, so I think, uh, I think very much it's been a very strong bipartisan uh, effort. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. I thank uh, the chairman for calling uh, this uh, hearing and for calling all the hearings and attention to this uh, national uh, uh, problem that's uh, destroying our youth and uh, many of the productive citizens of our country. Um, I also thank him for uh, agreeing to my request for this hearing because uh, I think it's important that this matter be investigated. I call for this hearing because of, uh, of really two reasons. First, I was uh, dumbfounded when I learned that the first act of our uh, drug czar may in fact have been to bury a report that had uh, critical information that was uh, a conscientious uh, report. Uh, uh, secondly, I, uh, I was most concerned when I learned that there was uh, 
attempted intimidation of others to keep this report uh, from the Congress and the American people. Uh, those are the two reasons why I asked uh, for this report. Uh, I, I'm not the only one that's called for an examination of what this administration's uh, policy or lack of policy is. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> I think you wrote uh, to the President, Mr. Chairman, uh, not too long ago, and you quoted the Wall Street Journal where uh, our FBI uh, director and uh, DEA director said, and I quote, last spring, uh, uh, this is from that article, last spring Federal Bureau of Investigation Director Louis Free and DEA's Mr. Constantine wrote a scathing memo to Mr. Clinton warning that the administration's drug strategy was dangerously adrift, my, not my words, their words. Then we have a report that in fact um, uh, details uh, uh, the failure of this policy. And let me tell you the rest of why I uh, call, call for this hearing. I learned from a source close to the rep uh, report uh, certain facts that were brought to my attention. First of all, the damning conclusions of this, that, and this is a non-political, it's not a Republican, it's not a Democrat, it's a, a non-political, in fact, it's a, an empirically rigorous assessment, which was commissioned not by me, not by this committee, but by those at the very top of the administration, was in fact intentionally uh, buried uh, uh, and may have been done so as the first act of our new uh, drugs are. The authors of the study presented their conclusions in person uh, to the new drugs are in the company of others, and we'll hear from some of those folks today early this year. Uh, when the new drug czar learned the conclusions, uh, uh, he instructed uh, uh, that the study be quashed. Incredibly, the report's existence, and again, I, I uh, repeat what my colleague just said, this is the final, it's its final draft. Uh, I had, as a member of this committee, I just got a copy of this, in fact, got it from the press before I got it officially, but this has been quashed uh, uh, since uh, May of this year, and actually uh, from uh, March when it was originally uh, uh, kept uh, secret. What further concerns me is that the new drugs are thereafter knowingly embrace the same pro-treatment, reduced interdiction and source country level prevention priorities in the President's 1996 White House drug strategy that were set by President Clinton in 1993, 1994, and 1995. In, sh in summary, the White House knowingly quashed its own rigorous but damaging study in an election year because that study showed the failure of the Clinton policies in the prior three years. It also detailed the cost of, of that failure and it was a quantifiable increase in the number of drug users and annual drug related deaths. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that the evidence of that report is very clear. The, uh, the what concerns me is not just that, that this uh, report has been suppressed and buried and now uh, kept until maybe after the election. But let me show you in my community what this has done. This is the headline from the Orlando Sentinel, July 14, 1996. Long out of sight, heroin is back killing teens. I come from a very peaceful, suburban, prosperous central Florida. This is what's going on. This is the headline in my paper this past uh, Sunday, a week ago, Sunday, Orlando area teen drug use soars. So as a parent, as a member of Congress, as a concerned American, and someone who is not a Johnny come lately on this, I asked for hearings, uh, in fact, had over 100 members bring a signed letter to the former chairman of this committee begging for a hearing about a policy we knew was sending the children of this country down the tubes, and, and that hearing was denied, and I was gaveled out of order in, in this uh, very room because no one wanted to pay attention to that problem. So we've seen what's taken place. Now I'm concerned about what I've heard that's taken place with this study. 
we see the results uh, in my neighborhood, not just in Baltimore, uh, but all across this land. And we need to make sure that, uh, uh, that, that this uh, whole drug uh, abuse problem and uh, that the attention given by this administration and everyone in Congress is, is a priority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Micah. At this point, I'd like to uh, welcome our first panel. Uh, these three gentlemen authored the uh, report we are discussing today. Uh, they come from the Institute for Defense Analysis. Dr. Barry Comfort is Assistant Director of the Operational uh, Evaluation Division of IDA. Doctors Rivolo and Comfort are research staff members of the Operational Evaluation Division. We thank you for being here, uh, gentlemen. With that, uh, I would ask you to come forward. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give this as a subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. Thank you. Let the record show that the uh, question was answered in the affirmative. We'd like, if you would, to uh, perhaps uh, each of you uh, give your uh, opening statements, condense them, uh, balance your opening statement. Written statement could be uh, accepted for the record, but uh, if you kind of condense it and try to fit it into approximately five minutes or so, each of you. Statement to the committee staff uh, yesterday, and we request that it be placed in the record. Uh, I am Barry. Cr I'm sorry. I'm uh, Barry Crane, the project leader for the counter drug uh, effort. Uh, to to my right is uh, Dr. Rex Rivolo, the, the principal analyst, and to my left is Dr. Gary Comfort. We are pleased to have this opportunity to clarify the content and status of our report. The principal objective of our research has been to examine the effectiveness of source zone interdiction activities upon cocaine supply in the United States. Based upon that examination, to suggest strategies and operational activities to increase effectiveness. We believe that the central finding of our report is that a well-conceived source zone action have directly resulted in significant increases in the street price of cocaine in the United States and through market impact of price upon demand and resulted in, in decreased consumption of cocaine. We have found that effective source zone activities can be conducted at a relatively modest funding level, and therefore that well-conceived source zone operations can be more cost-effective than has been previously acknowledged. I don't mean to imply that all operations uh, are necessarily cost-effective. Uh, one can pursue uh, ineffective strategies and tactics in the source one just like anywhere else, but our research indicates that activities that can significantly and unexpectedly disrupt the established coca distribution channels will rapidly produce real effects on the street of the United States. A major purpose of a, of a draft document is the stimulation of dialogue, the examination of hypotheses, and the receipt and consideration of constructive cons uh, con criticisms. That process is ongoing. We believe that the final report that will result from this process will incorporate a number of clarifications while retaining the findings we believe are central to the research. We believe our research has been of assistance to those responsible for planning and executing source and interdiction efforts, and we expect the final report that results from the ongoing review process will be a useful tool to, tool to motivate and assist the planning and execution of additional cost-effective source zone actions. That's our opening statement, sir. Either of you gentlemen have opening statements? No, we don't, Mr. Chairman. We no, fully no. subscribe to that. Okay. I guess one quick question that I would have, just starting, and I've been involved with a corporate career, and as well as the small business, and as well as being in Congress here. And, and uh, you say that this is a draft, and it's ongoing, and it'll be. Apparently, this is not a final draft. Let me uh, clarify the way uh, IDA manages its uh, process. Uh, a substantial uh, document, as you'll see in the front cover of the report. Uh, goes through a much more a strenuous review process. The purpose of our draft was to get out uh, our initial findings for comment and review to strengthen it. It is a very important uh, aspect of the scientific process to get and receive criticism. Uh, we ask for strong criticism, and, and the purpose of that is to clear up misconceptions, errors in exposition, or even faulty reasoning. But in this case, uh, we do need to make some improvements in exposition. I guess, I guess my, uh, my problem here is, is how many drafts are, are you into now? What, what number is this one? Uh, this particular Mark Final. 
uh, this is the, is the only one marked final. It was is the intended for distribution internal to the in, interagency. But how uh, many drafts preceded the final? Uh, just three, sir. There are, this is, if you look, this is a, what we call a slant four, and that's a fourth uh, draft. We did receive other criticisms. So, so the idea is the Defense Department contract, contracts you to go out and do a study. You come back, and then you present the results of the study, and then you get asked to keep changing it? Is, uh, is that no, sir. We don't get asked to keep changing it. What we do is receive the criticism. We evaluate those things, and we and continually improve the report. The criticisms we receive, for example, from ONDCP are extremely valuable uh, criticisms. They do not change the central thesis, but will greatly improve our ability to communicate those findings effectively. So, so you haven't changed the basic uh, philosophy of the report, the basic conclusions of the report still remain the same from beginning to end? Yes, sir. For the most part, that is true. For the most part. Okay. And, and you stand by your original conclusions? The primary conclusion that the source zone operations are highly effective, well, we stand by those. And what about the RAND study? Uh, we believe that we have obtained substantial data. Uh, we tried to understand the uh, certain aspects of the cocaine market. We matched that data to the, way, the methodology of the RAND study, and the conclusion we came to is that we could not uh, follow the, the uh, analysis of that study because the data didn't, uh, contradicted that approach. So let's see if I hear you right. You couldn't follow the analysis of the study, so does that mean that the study was flawed? Uh, there are, like any other study, the there are the portions of it. Uh, let me be like, specific. Uh, you couldn't follow the analysis of the study. Therefore, we're referring to the RAND study of 1994, which basically has a heavy emphasis on treatment, and thereby has we made decisions to cut back interdiction. I'm asking you, is the study, in your judgment, flawed? The conclusions of that RAND study of 1994. The, the conclusion that, that the source zone, and I'll, I'll be specific here because there are many conclusions, but the, the primary conclusion, the source zone interdiction activities were very ineffective. That is, it would cost $783 million to change consumption 1 percent uh, versus treatment. Uh, we found that not to be true right. from our data. And so I guess the question uh, is, is that w w why I think it's important and why we value the importance of the work that you've done here is, is that if we are going through a false premise that treatment of hardcore drug addicts is the key to the future of the drug war, then we, and, and as a result of that false premise, we've cut back in a major degree interdiction source country programs as well as uh, transit zone programs, then, you know, we've got to make some adjustments and change direction, I would think, or at least in balance. Would you agree with that? It, it is really the objective of our work to present the analytic findings. Uh, there are certainly other reasons one does treatment, and I would defer that to, to the making decisions of how to allocate resources and so on to those who make that. We present our findings, which says that uh, it is less cost effective than had previously been known. So I guess, yes, sir. Could I just suggest that uh, the majority of our work was based upon the review of actual data. The majority of the RAND study is uh, the presentation of models as to how the system works. What our conclusion found was that in several cases we were unable to match the actual data to the models of the RAND study. Uh, you can look for uh, uh, a number of reasons to possibly explain those discrepancies, but we believe that the data are what the data are, and as okay, a result, well, I guess the last question is ask it a different way. Then was the RAND study model flawed, in your opinion? In selected cases, it does not match the data, and as a result, since we believe the data speak for themselves, uh, we have to say that, that uh, in some cases, for, for example, uh, in the question of the, uh, which I know is central to some of your thoughts, of the cost effectiveness of treatment, it being so much less than the cost effectiveness of source zone interdiction. Our data showed that source zone interdiction when c carried out from well-conceived operations can be much more cost effective than had been modeled by the RAND study. Our data took the RAND study's numbers for treatment as presented in their document. We just substituted the projected number of treatments that would result from increased expenditures 
for the actual data that was available to us for the actual expenditures in treatments in 1995, and we found that that led to a much lesser cost effectiveness than what Rand had modeled. That does not in itself speak to the cost effectiveness of treatment. It just says that we saw that the actual data did not fit the Rand projections. I guess what concerns me, uh, and obviously this is a sensitive subject because people have strong feelings and many decisions have been made as a result of the RAND study. But backing up from that, uh, did you, as you presented your study, and you've gone through some drafts here, you say three drafts, and you're so apparently at a final draft here, yet to be disseminated, uh, but has anybody tried to convince you to change your thinking and take out the information on the treatment and de-emphasize that uh, in any way? I personally, I've, I'm kind of been the inside author and in that I stay in the office and these other gentlemen have been doing the interacting, so if okay, I would we'll have, have to, I would to, have to defer I guess to them. my time has run out. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Hassett from Illinois. My buddy from Maryland. I do uh, exist. I will make up. I will make, <laughs> hey, listen. Yeah, I'm not a potted fly, I'm not a potted plant over here. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, with all due respect. All I right. apologize. Thank you. Let me let me ask you. Who is? Uh, did any of you all uh, brief? There have been several comments about Mr. Uh, General McCafferty and somebody uh, suppressing this report and all this kind of thing. Did any of you all brief him? Any? And, and who would have uh, said that? Any of you all? You heard the testimony, did you not? Y yes, sir. Uh, neither of us briefed General McCaffrey. None of them. Okay. Let me let me ask you something. There's an internal report, uh, the IDA report, and there's several things uh, that that is very critical of, of your own internal report is very critical of this whole dra draft. Um, well, how do you all respond to 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 what's said in that report? Let me let me just point out one thing. Very quickly, in the, on page three of our of this uh, analysis, it says uh, the first thing uh, I learned in my ec economic tractic econometrics course is the correlation does not imply causation. Then it goes on. How did you all respond to that? Respond to that, Mr. Cummings. Um, first of all, I like to point out that. In addition to that one critique, we have five others which say this is a wonderful piece of work, publish it. Um, May we have that, please? Certainly. To all okay. of those? Absolutely. The, the arguments that are presented in this paper uh, came after the issues were raised at uh, ONDCP, I believe, and we looked for a, an economist because the work really did not involve an economist. And since we have a very good economist, uh, we were sent to him for review. He came back with that very scathing uh, review. We since then interacted for a very long time, uh, for at least two weeks, almost on a daily basis, whereby we went item by item and explained what was done. Uh, he has since modified his views, and if you were to bring him up and ask him, you might get quite a different situation from that original review. Notwithstanding what I just said, the basic criticism is that the report does not address the scientific work in an economist's point of view. I'm not an economist. I'm a physicist. I look at the market as a physical system. I could care less about economic models. All I look for is cause and effect if I can prove it, if I need some economic piece of uh, application theory or procedure, I go and look for that. We have looked at much of that. After looking at most of it, I decided that I did not need any of it to make the statement. And I might say that the nature of this document, as was alluded to by my colleague, is really one to convey information without backup evidence. We never, we never said that this document should be a standalone, self-sufficient document. This document coalesces about two years of work, very extensive work, into a few pages. You cannot do everything. The reason was that we believed that the results were very important and should become part of the discussion for the strategy. 
I might, at this point, take the opportunity, I don't have a fancy, glossy figure, but I do have some data presentation, which essentially outlines our entire argument. If the members could uh, pick I, this I'd up. I'd like to have that, but let me, yeah. let me move on, if you sure. don't mind. I have a few seconds here. Um, the, one of the things that has arisen uh, here lately, and not lately, but in my community, is crack cocaine. Crack cocaine is very cheap. And tell me how that played into your report. I'm just curious. Because most of, I, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of people, young people, addicted in Baltimore and throughout this country are on crack cocaine. So tell me how that figured into all of this. Yes, sir. Crack cocaine is just another form of cocaine, except that it addresses the very bottom end of the distribution machinery in that it's sold in very small quantities uh, at very high prices, I might say. The price of crack is cheap because the quantities are cheap and you can afford to buy a single piece of rock which may contain as little as 20 milligrams. That is why it's cheap. But we on the other hand, it's also a very addictive drug and quickly addictive. Is that correct? I cannot address the addictive. Well, uh, I, I want, in answering my question, I think you have to address that in some kind of way because although it's cheap, there's a lot of it that's needed. And I base that upon my neighborhood and talking to people on crack cocaine. It's highly addictive, and people, and based upon what you just said, it comes in small quantities, and because it's so addictive, they need a lot of it. So go, take it from there. I just want that to be a part of your, your statement. Yes, sir. That may very well be the case. However, in looking at the industry and the market as a whole, crack cocaine was folded in with all other forms of cocaine. That was just a different delivery system. And the reasons why crack cocaine appeared can be addressed, and at some point, if you wish me to, I can do that, but uh, the distinction between crack and other forms of cocaine, in my opinion, is artificial, and as far as a monitor on the market, they all should be lumped in together. Would you comment on uh, whether you brief others on the draft report? I think you, someone said this is the fourth. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I would like to point out that the first inklings of what we were looking at happened very early in 1995, February, January. We were starting to brief the interdiction community, that is the, the uh, DEA, US military, customs, those people, with this concept that there may be a better way to monitor what their effectiveness is by looking at market dynamics rather than seizures. It was very clear from the beginning the seizures are irrelevant, absolutely useless indicators. And therefore, we did not, and we can show you evidence why we believe that. Once this material arose, we believe that the significance of it was worth distributing. And we distributed, we talked to the DEA, we talked to customs extensively. We made trips to South America. We talked a great deal to agencies in Washington. We talked to a CNC. We tried to promulgate this information at that time, very early on. At about the same time, there was a discussion that Peru was about to implement a major new strategy. That strategy was one that we had already identified as extremely, extremely effective if it was indeed implemented. And that if Peru proceeded with that implementation, that within six months, we should see street prices rising significantly. This piece of data which I distributed is essentially the evolutionary history of that statement. By September of 1995, many individuals besides us, and I might refer you to an article in New York Times dated 15 September 95, in what officials described as the most precipitous shift in almost six years, the wholesale price of cocaine has increased nearly 50% since May, while retail prices have gone up 30%. We believe that way before that report came out. There are other articles at the time. Various DEA police task forces across the country were saying, what is going on here? We knew fully well what was going on, and we were trying to promulgate it. Right about at that time, the RAND reports were released. And we diverted our attention from presenting this logic and this methodology to essentially analyzing the RAND reports. And they were a large digression, which took a lot of time. Just one more question, just 
Please, Mr. Chairman. You just said something that really kind of struck me. You said, and I want to make sure I understood you. You said the, the seizures were irrelevant, or are you saying that as a part of this report, information about seizures is irrelevant? I, I'm just curious. I just want to make sure, because this committee has spent a lot of time on interdiction, and I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. That's all. Yes, sir. The canonical measure of effectiveness has always been seizure, seizure rate. Uh, in looking at the technical implications of that, we quickly see that seizures correlate with availability. That is, when there's a lot of drug on the market, seizures are very high. When there is none, seizures are very low. And therefore, to try to measure success with something which goes up and down with availability is counter. And we dismissed that very early on. We came to the conclusion that the amount of material seized does not affect the market. And when you back that up by other studies, for instance, that production capacity is about 30 times the current production, tells you that if the market has to expand by 30, 40 percent for seizures, it does so, and it does so very quickly. And in fact, if we increased the seizures, they would increase, and the cost of operations would be very small, because I might remind you that the cost of production for cocaine is about one dollar per gram. And if you double it or triple it, it's still fairly small amount of money to lose if the final product sells for $15,000 uh, $15 a gram and ultimately on the streets for $100, $150. So our analysis came to the conclusions, and we stand behind it, we like to debate it and open, that seizures is a very poor indicator. And one of the criticisms of the RAND report in our report was that that was used as a gauge of the effectiveness of treatment versus interdiction. Mr. Cummings, if I could just point out regarding seizures, that our study has primarily looked at what causes disruptions to the ongoing price trends, uh, so that we've been interested in what co causes those price trends to change over fairly short amounts of time. Uh, clearly underlying the overall price trend, uh, seizure has its place. It certainly increases the cost of doing business to those who are trafficking in drugs and certainly adds something to their costs, which wind up being uh, in some addition to the street prices. Our point is that in the shorter term, with the more dramatic effects on pricing, we don't see that seizures makes a bit, is a good indicator to tell you you're doing things correctly. Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hassert. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Revillo, Revillo, right? Revolo. Revolo, okay. I, I want to very quickly take two follow-ups uh, on uh, the questions from the gentleman from uh, Maryland. Uh, and if you could answer, let me lay this out and you answer whether it's right or wrong. To take the last question, that seizures in this country, whether you're finding something in a false bottom of a semi-trailer truck or and a camper that goes across I-80 and goes through Illinois in my district, for instance, there's so much substance in the pipeline that a seizure here and a seizure there really hasn't affected what the market price of that product is. Is that what you said? Uh, I must clarify. Seizures uh, in the United States, once the material has been run through the machinery, is very valuable. And loss of that material costs the machinery a great deal of money, and therefore it's felt. However, it's immediately replaced. There is no obstruct. People think that we can affect the supply. We cannot affect the supply. The supply. On the high sea or seizures in airplanes. Those are less valuable. They're are much less valuable because the product doesn't cost much. Leaving Columbia at a dollar a gram, if they lose a few tons, it's no big deal. You just replace it. It's a nuisance cost of doing business. All right. And they, well, and they account for that in, in their pricing structure. Now let me go back to the first question that the gentleman asked. He asked you, basically, in my understanding, is if there's a, dis not the seizures, but a disruption in the pipeline, if the shoot-down policy in Peru, for instance, or the uh, situation where you interdicted a large... Uh, logistical node, for instance, at the San Jose de uh, Guarave in, in Colombia, that made a difference. And that type of strangling the pipeline showed empirical evidence at the end that the cost of, when the cost of that uh, product went uh, very high 
as compared as when there's no disruption to the pipeline and the cost, as the gentleman said, on the streets of Baltimore uh, for crack cocaine or any type of cocaine is very cheap. Is that correct? Uh, what is very cheap? The, the cost, if there's no uh, disruption the in the pipeline, the cost of that product on the streets of, of uh, Baltimore is cheap, relatively cheap. There is very elaborate distribution chain at which the value of the material increases rapidly by going through about four or five steps. At each step, the value increases. I'm talking to street price. Yeah. Basically, very simple. Okay. If street Once price in Baltimore is cheap, that means there probably hasn't been a disruption in the pipeline along the way. Th is that's that correct. correct. Okay. Basically, when there is a disruption in the pipeline, then uh, and you squeeze down the ability of drugs to move out of, out of Colombia, or you break down the uh, transportation system between uh, Peru and Colombia, then evidently along the line it shows a rise in the price. Is that correct on the street? If the transportation pipeline is interdicted, not poking holes in it by seizing, because that's, that's easily replaced. If you interfere with the normal transportation or production mechanism, which is strongly dependent on one mode, you will immediately have a shortage okay. produced, because it's not a matter of, re uh, of replacing. I don't want too much information. Right. I just want the understanding here. So basically, if you can stop uh, the transportation, if you can squeeze down the pipeline, then you raise prices. And if prices are high in the street, purity becomes low, and sometimes the ability for people to buy, especially for recreational use, uh, is imp somewhat impaired. Is that, that correct? That is correct. Okay. <clears throat> so there is a, a relevance there. And that's basically the whole background for your study, is it not? That is correct, sir. All right. Mr. Rivolo, let me ask you, you're the principal author of this report. Is that correct? I'm um, not the principal author, but I am the analyst. I did All right. the analytical. You spent a year doing the analysis and bringing back, uh, beginning back in December of 1994. Is that correct? Yes. And the IDA has in the past then been critical of the Defense Department's, uh, correct in some cases, uh, for instance, uh, on the B-2 bomber and the Osprey program? There have been many times where IDA's position has conflicted with the sponsor, yes, sir. All right. Now, uh, I want to make uh, your report was sponsored by the IDA, right? That's who basically you work for and, and put the report. Uh, the sponsor is the uh, Secretary's office. So they actually the Secretary of Defense asked you to do this study. Uh, the, the Assistant Under Secretary for Drug Policy. Yes. Fine. Now I want to take up two important issues with you. And I want to remind you that certainly you're under oath, as you know and sworn to tell the whole truth uh, to this congressional panel as you personally remember it, uh, no matter how difficult that may be to you. Before I get to the substance of your report, the internal memos surrounding that report and the conclusion of that report, which suggest interdiction is cost effective and that the administration's RAND study is unsound. Let me start with a different matter. The high volume uh, well, well, when you went to brief uh, the head of ONDCP, uh, you said that you had never briefed the drug czar. Is that correct? That's correct. I answered that, sir. I uh, I'm, okay. But you were about to brief the drug czar. Is that correct? We were asked by Admiral Kramick to take the briefing with its important conclusions to the drug czar directly, yes, sir. So when you were about to uh, brief the drug czar uh, after some type of a meeting, uh, you were told that the briefing was no longer necessary. Is that correct? At the time uh, of the briefing, we were brought to ONDCP by Admiral Kramick and I believe uh, one or two other staffers. And the intent was to brief the general. Now, uh, ONDC, tell me, where, where is that? It's up on uh, 4th Street or 5th Street. So it's Street. part of the White House? It's just very close to the White House. All right. We, uh, we came in with the prepared briefing. We sat down. Uh, uh, General McCaffrey came in, asked to be pre-briefed by Admiral Kramick. Right. They went into a room. We were expecting five minutes. It took about 30 minutes. 
Um, and they came out, and Admiral Kramick relayed to us that uh, the general did not want to hear our briefing, and that, um, that uh, in the following day's presentation, which we were to brief the interagency, that, um, uh, that some discussion of supply and demand should not take place. And well, let, me get, let me get this straight, and if you indulge me, Mr. Chairman, for a minute. Now, when I was raising my young <coughs> sons, who are now older, sometimes when they, I was telling them something, I found out that they put their hands over their ears. They didn't want to hear it. With the presumption if you didn't hear it, you didn't have to understand it, and then you didn't have to be behave. Was this somewhat what happened here? Uh, I, I don't want to speculate on what, is, what the motivation was. Uh, I understand. You I know what happened, and basically um, he did not want to listen to the work for whatever reasons, and he left. And, um, now let me ask you another question. I understand this is uh, just relayed to us. I'm not, you're the people who were there. Now you were standing basically outside the door waiting to go in to do the briefing. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you overhear any of the conversation in the other no, room? No, sir. You couldn't hear anything. You couldn't hear anything at all? You, you heard elevated voices once or twice, but you re, there was I mean, no way you could understand anything. Elevated voices like shouting? Elevated. Excitement? I think the, the meeting was, was an excited one, but right. uh, you know, we were not in there. Thank you. Uh, I'll yield back. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Mr. Ravillo, you uh, went there, though, with the intent of uh, briefing the drug czar. Yes, sir. That was your purpose. Yes, sir. And you said you got into the room, you put your uh, papers out, and then you were asked to leave? Uh, no, we never got into the room. You never we, got into the room. We were sitting in the, uh, in the waiting hall, waiting for General McCaffrey to come. He came in. He, uh, he waved uh, Emerald Kramick in. Emerald Kramer came out and said he wants a pre-briefing, give me the slides. He took my slides. They went in and we sat outside for the duration. And it's your under Now, uh, when you were told to stand or, or wait outside and you said you heard elevated voices, uh, what, was Kramick yelling at, uh, uh, at the drug czar? I don't know who was yelling to whom. Um, um, you have to ask the people in that room. Was anyone else in the room? Uh, I'm confused on that issue because I was under the impression that it was only Admiral Kramick, but my colleague uh, is very certain that there were other people in there, and um, you, you'll have to ask him. But uh, I, I suspect that his memory on this issue is much better than mine. I, I did not make much the of The only memory. one you remember, then, is Admiral Kramick in the yes, room? Sir. But you think there were others? Yes. Um, after the meeting, did Admiral uh, Kramick emerge, and did he apologize to you for the event? And also, uh, did he indicate in any way that uh, the uh, drug czar had rejected uh, the study or the conclusions? Uh, Yes, sir. Admiral Kramer came out. He said, I'm sorry, uh, the general does not want to take your briefing at this time. And uh, we were surprised. We asked a question or two, like, why, what's wrong? And basically, he relayed that uh, he does not believe the conclusions, and he doesn't uh, like, um, basically, the comparison between interdiction and, and treatment. And therefore, uh, uh, un until further notice, that's, that's the status. We then drove uh, it, back. Before you get to that, can I ask you, did you hear him say or indicate in any way uh, to you that uh, not a word of this is to, to get out? Uh, after the ride back to the Pentagon where the meeting was going on, uh, the words that were given to us by Admiral Kramick were, uh, well, until for, and there was a long discussion in between, that until further notice, not, uh, not a word of this can, can get out, yes, sir. Now, is it your understanding that those were, was that a directive by Admiral Kramick or was that something he was passing on from uh, the drug czar? Uh, I'm not sure it was a directive uh, from anyone. Um, I mean, in principle, no one can stop us uh, except the sponsor. And much of this work was not done for Admiral Kramick, it was done for Mr. Sheridan. 
Um, however, uh, Mr. Uh, Admiral Kramick uh, essentially was trying to make the best of the situation, and he said, uh, whether it was a it was never interpreted as a directive, but we certainly would follow his desires. We have enormous respect for Admiral Kramick. Well, he, then, do you, was it motivated? Do you think Admiral Kramick is the one that was, that wanted, didn't want this information out? No, I do not believe that. So, uh, it had to be then. Uh, and this may be your assumption, but it had to be. Um, the drug czar was not pleased with the uh, conclusion that your report reached and took uh, uh, a different uh, position and didn't want uh, that information out. Is that, would that be a fair assumption? Uh, that would be conjecture on my part, and that is the conjecture that I held at the time. Did you, do you recall anyone telling you that uh, the drugs are uh, Uh, physically uh, pushed uh, Admiral Kramick, or uh, the word that I had was uh, pushed him against the wall. Did anyone say anything about uh, the, the, the conflict that took place in that room? During the ride back, there were some discussions, and I'm not quite sure who was uh, in those discussions, but. Uh, there were some comments made about uh, the managerial style of Admiral McCaffrey. Everyone knows him, but uh, I would not, I would not comment to any substance of anything relating to what went on in the room. Did, was Mr. Boyer with you, uh, that, an assistant to uh, Admiral, Admiral Kramick? That's one of the, uh, the the discrepancies that my colleague and I have. In that, I was under the impression that he was not. He is under the impression that he was. But I do remember that there were several people in the staff car, um, whether they... Do you remember uh, whether it was Admiral Kramick that talked about the um, severity of the, the, the conflict uh, in that discussion, and, uh, uh, or, or was it someone I, else? I really don't think that Admiral Kramick would, uh, would comment on things like that. So. Whatever was said, either it was by, by uh, implication or by you know, projection of personalities, I'm not quite sure. Uh, did, you, did there come a time afterwards when you or one of the other author, authors contacted someone in, else in the White House drug czar's office, perhaps uh, maybe a week later, to seek permission to release this report to members of Congress? Uh, it was not a, uh, if that happened, it happened through the sponsor's office. We well, let me comment Mr. As, as, Mr. The project, Crane. as the project leader. Uh, I sought clarification after the, the days when we had the briefings, and I asked the following questions of both sponsors. Do we have any instructions at all to, to, to begin, end any of the type of work on price and demand? And, and the, the answer was absolutely not. In fact, uh, we have produced other briefings. I, uh, I gave a talk on the 7th and 8th using that same data. So uh, I went to look at, did any of the, uh, of our documents that were published in conference proceedings, were they changed with respect to this? I could find no evidence of it. So I have been able to find no evidence of any, uh, you know, taking out or censoring of our material that I'm aware of, sir. Mr. Uh, Ravello, again, uh, was there a time shortly after this incident, the presentation, when uh, uh, you or any of the other authors contacted uh, the White House Drug Czar's office and uh, sought to uh, permission to release the report to members of Congress? Uh, not to my knowledge and not uh, that I have done. My only time in which that question was asked, it was asked to Admiral Kramick. Uh, it was about a week, perhaps, after that event. And after we had our usual discussion about typical operations and what was working and what wasn't, uh, Barry asked the Admiral, sir, are we in any way uh, not to discuss any aspect of this? And uh, he was very adamant about it. He says, absolutely not. You guys are doing great work. You continue to do and uh, preach whatever you think is correct. So, that is the only time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll get back to you. I, uh, uh, Dr. Rivalo, how did you feel when 
you know, you've been working on this report for how long? About 18 months. 18 months, so it's a year and a half, uh, and you were probably pretty excited that you had some good information that would be well received? Uh, yes, sir, because first of all, I did not expect to find what I found, and I thought that the material was very, very timely in light of what was going on in South Because we're, we're in the process of putting appropriations bills together, working on the new strategy I, and having I, I new drugs. I was not are too concerned with the appropriations. I was concerned with the strategy in South America in implementing basically the, the, the philosophy of PDD-14 where we were going to try to interdict the machinery of cocaine production rather than trying other strategies. And we now had evidence that that strategy would work. Now, how did you feel about, you know, not getting able to present your report? And how did you feel about the reactions that took place and, you know, Admiral Kramer coming back and telling you that uh, it's not going to see the light um, of day? And, and just I was, describe your feelings. I was very surprised, uh, but I am very naive in this game. I've been in the academic world too long. Um, I was very surprised and I was angry. I was really angry because it was not a political statement in any sense. All it was here. Look at this. We can actually make a connection between what goes on in the interdiction role in South America and the prices in the street of LA and New York. That information needs to be folded in somewhere. It's not my job to do that unless you ask, but this is important information. And if we take a look at what's happened since 1992 in terms of the lack of support for interdiction, it probably says that maybe we're on the wrong path? Um, it, let, me, let me ask you a different question then. Uh, if, if, if you see drug use among teenagers soaring, you see that we have an epidemic, you have to go back and take a look at what was working prior to 1992 and take a look at maybe revisiting that and seeing if maybe we have to go back to something that was working. Would, would a, relative to your report, does that common sense wise say maybe we ought to take another look? Uh, I believe that the, the strategy to fight drugs has to be a very broad and incorporate many elements. I, I believe that the interdiction role has always been dismissed, dismissed by the community at large. And we believe that at this point, I did not believe it 18 months ago, that interdiction has a role and in fact can be a very effective role. The, the rising trends in young people, um, I, I do have my own opinion on that, uh, but uh, whether they are linked or not, I don't know. We do know that in the case of cocaine, and by the way, we have only studied cocaine, that in the case of cocaine, prices hit a record low in uh, late uh, 94, early 95. So common sense wise, the lower the price, the broader the distribution, the more people that will try it. Uh, apparently, the law of supply and demand is not heeded to by much of the community. Many of the people who work in this industry do not believe that that law operates. Uh, well, we let certainly me ask do. you, so that I understand, do you believe it operates? Absolutely. Okay. And, and I guess, uh, Dr. Crane, I, I just, I looked at this, uh, this letter from, uh, I guess it was uh, basically from, uh, uh, Mr. Boyer from uh, Admiral Kramick's office uh, to you, Dr. Uh, Crane, and relative to changing some of the in content of the report, just read two paragraphs. Uh, the draft paper on source zone in, in addiction effectiveness is an excellent step toward qualifying, quantifying a very complex issue. A linkage between interdiction efforts and cocaine price fluctuations is one that we have in intuitively based our supply reduction strategy upon, and it's gratifying to see that the impact can be quantified. And in another paragraph, um, uh, the discussion of the cost effectiveness of treatment programs is of great value, but not necessary to the analysis of the intrinsic value of the interdiction programs, and possibly beyond the purview of USIC or DOD related taskings for IDA. Recommend this issue be removed from the paper and treated separately or as a minimum place in an appendix so that the interdiction effectiveness discussion can proceed separately. And then a little handwritten note, good work. Uh, I, 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 would you be willing to comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, we did as in a previous draft uh, get comments in, uh, in, in a previous draft from the different sponsors. However, uh, this was prior to any of these events. and um, the Prior to which events? Well, to the May 8th the document. and. Um, 
he certainly in no way tried to, as you know, it's in the document, he in no way tried to do it. So I didn't interpret that uh, as any restriction on whether we should put it in or not. And it was one of the many types of uh, letters uh, that we got uh, giving us advice on what to put in the document or not. But I will, I will tell you that we uh, made our own judgment on that. That's one of, we have very uh, uh, strict rules about independence. And uh, no one put us under any pressure, and we put in what we felt was appropriate okay. for this draft document. Let me ask discussion. Dr. Ruolo, uh, were you asked to soften your approach on treatment? Did you uh, take anything out relative uh, to treatment? No, and you must realize that my communication and feedback is purely numeric and computer and numbers. Uh, those discussions are handled by, by Dr. Crane. And, you, and so you never talked to Mr. Sheridan or? Uh, we did talk to Mr. Sheridan and his, uh, and his uh, staff uh, many times. And did they suggest you taking treatment out or softening treatment? I, don't th I never recall any guidance one way or another. Um, okay. they, their guidance has always been you do what you think is best and make sure that it's sound. That's always what, been the What direction. bothers me with this, the way we do these reports, though, if you do all these drafts and you get all this guidance and you get all, I mean, what happens to just doing the work? And then we either accept or reject it based on the quality of the report. Why do we have to keep changing it so the people who are doing the report are happy with the results? It, it, it Unfortunately, some of that goes on. Most of the drafts are really for technical review. Okay. People complain about, well, this is not clear. This needs to be amplified. This is incorrect. But did this go on in any of these drafts? Did, yes. did, did we alter it so that the people would feel better about what they're doing? Let me comment as the project leader, sir. Um, it is standard procedure to have open discussion with the sponsors, uh, and then they express their concerns. They've always given us full freedom to, uh, I shouldn't say full freedom, but substantial amount of freedom uh, to put in there what we thought was important. And in no way, uh, we always seek uh, that information from them because uh, we might have overlooked something. And they were just one of many. Uh, I would say I had no fe feeling of any pressure at all with respect to that. We, we put in what we felt was appropriate for the draft for the interagency to look at. Okay, but, and, and I guess you said that this came out before you started changing the reports, but when, when, uh, when Boyer wrote, wrote you under item E, recommend deleting or softening any language that appears to be either combative with or condescending of the RAND study, or self-promoting of IDA, instead of taking a negative approach toward the RAND analysis, take a positive approach toward source country efforts and let the IDA analysis speak for itself. That didn't affect you in any way? Uh, not, not that I recall, sir. I mean, the, we haven't made any changes in the report yet. We're still evaluating all comments, so. How long, how long does it take to get a report from all the various drafts to a final completion? It's been 18 months, and then we are going to do six or eight months, or a couple of years, or? And then what happens to the effectiveness the, of the data? Uh, we, I, I gave one report to the interagency which involved this material at a classified level, compared it in December. Uh, we really didn't begin to write this report until, um, I would say, uh, February, March, April, May. It isn't uncommon then, uh, since it, it had a lot of substance to it, to receive a lot of criticism and try to fix the report and make a better product of it. So we're going through, in my opinion, not only the normal cycle, but a faster cycle than I'm, I'm accustomed in a lot of our reports. Mr. Chairman, if I could say on that, I believe we came, became aware of our own conclusions in the December time period. We then put them into a briefing form to convey them where we could. Uh, we then turned it into a report, a couple of internal drafts, a final draft that you have. Uh, we've received a number of comments. This is uh, uh, groundbreaking work. As a result, we expected it to be somewhat controversial. We are in the process, uh, well along in the process, of reviewing the comments, assessing them, and making the changes. We've been somewhat hampered in that, I will say, in that some of the comments, some of the constructive comments, were presented to us anonymously. We've, we've found in the, from other critiques that we were able to resolve our, dis what oftentimes were misunderstandings and miscommunications by sitting down and talking to the people. We've been somewhat hampered in going somewhat slower in this because what? we are, I'm not privy to who are some of the better comments. Why do you suppose done. this is taking place? Uh, I can only say that uh, we were provided the comments indirectly. Uh, uh, certainly these reviewers were not anonymous to ONDCP. No. They were only anonymous when they were presented forward to us. It was done under the, what is standard practice, that academic reviews for journals are conducted by, by reviewers who are anonymous to the authors. 
This was never intended, obviously, from its tone to be a paper for an academic journal. So we, we would welcome hearty, hearty and open discussion with all those who feel that they have valid comments. Meanwhile, as Mr. Cummings says, kids are dying on the streets of Baltimore and, and, and other countries around, in other states and countries around the world. Um, it just seems to me that something as vital as, as, as a report of this nature, if it's accurate, and again, at some point, I guess we're going to have to determine that. Uh, did, after we get through the methodology and, and, and all of that, do uh, you think there's general agreement with your final analysis? I think that our finding that, so that well-conceived source zone operations do have a direct effect of this upon the prices of cocaine in, in the streets of the United States and upon the purity of the streets, I believe we can we continue to have strong support for that. Okay, I would so you also think that will stand up. I believe so. I would also add uh, the comment you just read from Captain Boyer uh, about his suggestion as to what to do with the land, land analysis and the uh, the chart on cost effectiveness of treatment. Uh, you would find in, we hope in the tone of how we presented the results in that paper, uh, certainly in informal communications which you may have, that we have consistently viewed our work as a work on source zone interdiction. Uh, we found these other things, we, we in no way were attacking the effectiveness of treatment programs. Uh, we were merely pointing out, as I mentioned earlier, that the projections of their cost effectiveness was inconsistent with the actual data that we had gathered. Uh, we we are ourselves, as we indicated in the statement we provided for the record, are concerned that some of the findings we presented in a way that allowed easy misinterpretation of them, so that it is not at all an invalid criticism that we make a clear distinction in our report so that people understand what we have studied extensively and feel very comfortable on is the relationship of well-conceived source zone operations with the marketplace. Uh, we would not try to, to believe that the other things in our paper uh, are at the same level of importance to us or within the objective of our study. So, so just to finalize this, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Hastert, but um, from 1992 on, we have done major cuts in source country programs as well as transit zone programs. And what I'm understanding you to say is, is that based on your research, this is the wrong direction and ought to be revisited. We believe, based on our research, that well-conceived source zone operations are very effective. That does not mean, as Dr. Crane said in his opening statement, that you can't do foolish things throughout the program or things that aren't as effective as others. We think we have shown through our research the types of operations that can be very cost effective. Okay. Mr. Cummings from Maryland. Thank you very much. We, you all, you all uh, I think somebody asked you a little bit earlier, you all understand that you've been sworn here, is that right? And you all know what that means, is that right? And I'm sure you have an appreciation for one's integrity and reputation, do you not? Um, and I want to ask you some very, very pointed questions, and I want you to be very clear with me. Um, General McCaffrey is a person who I tr respect tremendously. And some accusations have been made from this uh, bar and I want to make sure that we're clear. And, I, and as I look down the witness list, you're probably about the only people that can answer the questions. Number one, do, have any of you all felt intimidated, intimidated with regard to this whole process, this report and getting it out and what have you? Have any of you? Uh, let me comment that at first we were a little, uh, I think, felt a little bit upset that these important findings might not be moving as quickly. But subsequent, when I, when I went and checked for what, what evidence was, were any of the reports not suppressed? Were we given any guidance not to continue the work? Uh, we have continued to, to use this information with the operational forces as best we can to improve operations. We've given numerous briefings since then. So at first, I think we might have felt that way, but I would say today uh, I, I'm not intimidated by it. No, sir. And, has, and to, to you, has directly, have you felt any intimidation by General McCaffrey? McCaffrey that's what I'm concerned about. This man's reputation is on the line. I'm concerned about it. Sir, I think I just answered that okay, question. Okay, fine. Sir, yes, sir. Let me say also, I have certainly not met the principles in general. As I indicated, I've been the inside author uh, with staying within my office bounds, more or less. But as was pointed out by the chairman, I believe, uh, the Institute for Defense Analyses has a long history of producing reports where we speak what we think is correct, whether they are pro-administration or against uh, policies. Uh, and truthfully, in our view, 
uh, whether it was pro or against or how it would be interpreted, had and has nothing to do with the way we report our research. Yes, sir. Uh, my, my personal view is that uh, the, the, in, the word intimidation is, uh, is really not appropriate. There was a day, maybe two days, right after that eventful attempt to brief, where I personally felt, uh, in, if you want to use the word intimidated, I felt. Now I want you to use the word as appropriate. We've got okay. the press here. They're getting ready to write stories. And it's been an accusation that somebody felt intimidated. And I want to know the answer, yes or no. We felt that we could not speak freely for that one day. Admiral Kramer came back very quickly. We made it, we asked the question very explicitly, are we being told not to do anything? And we were told, absolutely not. What I would like to point out is that in terms of feeling, and this is long before uh, uh, General McCaffrey came into that office, is that we felt ignored, that we were not allowed to discuss uh, findings. But uh, that single event on that one day only applied to that particular briefing, which apparently was objectionable. And I think you use the word conjecture at least two or three times during your testimony. And I'm just wondering, did you get anything, did whatever feeling you got, was that from General McCaffrey? I mean, do you, is that a result of something directly from General McCaffrey? No. All right, thank you. Let me ask you another question. Um, did, did, do you know whether, do you all have any direct evidence that General McCaffrey tried to quash this report? That's another accusation that was made. And I think since we're in the public domain, we need to be real clear on that with regard to a man's reputation. Did, I mean, we can go straight across. I'm just curious. I have no direct evidence. I have no direct evidence. I have never met General McCaffrey. And thank you. No, no there was one other thing that um, there was a, a phrase used to bury the report. That, that have you ever, you ever felt that you were, General McCaffrey asked you to bury the report? This is something that came from this bar. And I'm just wondering, did, do, have any of you felt, or have you have any direct evidence that General McCaffrey asked, uh, implied, or anything, that you bury the report? I yeah. myself have no direct evidence of that. Uh, no, the, uh, the word bury, uh, I used that word once, in fact, I used it at the meeting, but only referring to the events of the previous six months by ONDCP, not by General McCaffrey. And you, sir? Not my answer. I have right. Thank you. Answer. I just wanted to clear that up. Let me go on to some other things that um, I'm very interested in. Um, we, we, you talked about uh, the whole question of, um, of the uh, General McCaffrey and, McCaffrey and the initial uh, the report that he read. Is that the same report we're talking about today? In other words, the report that he read on the day that this meeting occurred, is that the same report that we're talking about today, the same draft? Uh, well, let me comment. Uh, we okay. had a briefing to give him what was classified, uh, that had the material. At the same time, uh, Admiral Kramer gave him the copy of the report you're discussing. What happened to those things, you would have to ask them. Okay, now let me, let me make it clear. The document that you gave, I'm sorry, and I, I'm glad you corrected me, did the document that you gave Kramick, was, first of all, was Kramick aware of all the stuff in the document? Did, he, did you brief him? Uh, yes, we had briefed. Uh, uh, there, there, were two, two, there were two pieces of material. One was a briefing report secret on operations. The other was uh, the, the report that you're uh, referring to in this hearing. And uh, both of those were left with General McCaffrey. All right. Now, so, and it's the same document. This fourth draft that we're talking about today, is that right? Uh, no, sir. It was, uh, it was probably a, a third draft or something. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same. So you don't know whether the document, you're saying you don't know whether the document that we are dealing with today, this draft, this fourth draft, is the document that was presented that day to General McCaffrey. Am I right? I think there, there might have been a change in the preface or two, but uh -huh. it's basically almost identical to the one that you have before you. Let me ask you this. In, in talking, I want you to just comment on this. I'm just curious. When I talk to the people, I live in a, in a drug-infested area, North and Madison Avenue in Baltimore City. It is drug-infested. And I have a chance to talk to a lot of the folk that are, are doing this kind of stuff and I'm trying to encourage them to get off, get treatment, whatever. The question, and when I ask them about prices, what they tell me, I just want you to comment if you can, if you can't, that's fine. They tell me that if the price goes up, they just do more crime. 
I mean, have you ever, have you, I mean, did you all take that into consideration? In other words, if you got an addict, they, the addicts have to have drugs. So the question becomes, I mean, and when we talk about effectiveness, I'm just curious, did you take that into consideration? You said you had your own personal opinions and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm just wondering about that. I mean, these are the guys, these are the folk who are on the street every day, the ones who break into houses and things, the women who sell their bodies. And I'm just wondering, does that have, I mean, did you take any of that into consideration? Uh, yes, we did. And in fact, uh, we have looked at the uniform crime statistics. We have looked at a huge number of data sources. Let me just give you a synopsis. When drug price, when cocaine, and again, I address cocaine only, when cocaine prices reversed in 1989 and almost doubled, there was a drop in drug-related homicides, a drop, a significant drop. Okay? That is to do with there's less drug available, there are less dealings going on, and the dealers do less shooting. That's one. That can be backed up by the Justice Department statistics. In terms of uh, petty crime, money raising crime, car thefts, that also shows a drop, although it doesn't appear to be correlated. However, you can exclude any rise, any rise in those statistics linked to price rises. Now, again, the only major price rise we've ever seen was 89 and 1990, and that is the data that we looked at in detail. We're in the process of looking at more current detail, but we have support from Department of Justice analysts who sort to agree, although I've not seen any reports, that certainly when it comes to drug-related homicides, 1989 was a bucket. It was an all-time low. Would you agree that the, it would, May I, may I just, may, Chairman, may I just ask one more question? Go ahead. Thank you. I think you've been kind of lenient with the other side. Let me ask you this. Very lenient <laughs> with you, my friend. Let me ask you this. When you look at the homicides are very significant, don't get me wrong, but it's the petty crimes. It is the breaking into houses, breaking into cars, taking car phones and things of that nature to sell them for $50 and whatever. I think that's very, that's, I mean, homicides are significant, but I think the pet, when you're trying to get money to buy some crack cocaine and get it quickly, it seems like that would have more relevance than, than say, the murders. I, just... I, I know that that is the accepted paradigm. We see no evidence for it. And we also might point to previous research done in the 70s relating crime to heroin use, which came to the same conclusions. Thank Gentleman's time has expired. Okay, Mr. Hastert. Uh, I thank the chairman. I first want to get this clear, because I'm completely amazed my uh, friend from the other side of the aisle saying that uh, through his anecdotal uh, research on the streets of Baltimore, that he would think that uh, if you make uh, great amounts of uh, narcotics available, you will reduce the amount of crime. I, I'm not sure how you uh, figure that, but if that's the point that he's trying to make, I really have a hard time understanding that. But I want to ask you, because uh, you haven't done anecdotal research. You've done real research. You uh, set up. Uh, cause and effect type of situations. As a physicist, uh, you can do that, I guess, best. I have to make some, uh, I've always said that I've been uh, appropriately apologetic for saying that I'm an economist. Uh, I always remember one of my good friends who uh, grew up with me out in the cornfields of Illinois. He wanted to be an economist, uh, but as a youth, he had his hand really taken off by a corn picker. And uh, the story was you could never get uh, uh, you know, accepted into the school of economics because most economic uh, sayings are, well, on the other hand, and he just didn't qualify. So uh, I understand the uh, softness of economic theory and the models. I've been involved in putting economic models together, and they're just that, economic models, and they're sometimes a relation to reality. Uh, there's not a lot there. But in your study, you went through and tried to show a correlation that if you can stop the amount of drugs flowing through the pipeline through huge events such as the shoot down policy in Peru or the uh, shutting down of a huge drug lab in Colombia, that there was actually a difference. There was an increase in price on the streets. And as you said, according to my friend from uh, uh, <clears throat> Maryland's uh, question, that there was actually a decrease in crime. Now, we spend $90 billion a year 
$90 billion a year, not on interdiction, not on this, but from the crime aspect, victims of crime, prosecuting criminals, all tied into drugs, and those deaths of teenagers, the same teenagers that are on the streets of Baltimore who get this stuff sometimes because the price is cheap and they can afford to get it for a recreational drug where they would have never been able to buy it as a recreational drug uh, prior if the price was so high that they couldn't afford it. Before they get hooked on this substance, before they go out committing crimes because they have to have it. Now, let me ask you a question. Is it relevant that if there's some type of study that shows that you can squeeze down the pipeline of drugs coming into this country and it makes a difference in the price of narcotics, cocaine in this situation, the purity of cocaine in this situation, and the incidence of crime in this situation, and it flies in the face of the so-called RAND study that the administration has adhered to since 1993, that basically shows twice the number of drug use in this country since that period of time, that shows our teenagers have uh, gotten into marijuana and other drugs, sometimes up to a 400% increase between certain age groups. That, that's a pretty relevant thing, is it not? It's extremely relevant if you believe those connections. Many of our colleagues in the economics community and the social scientists do not believe it. They dismiss all of these points of attachment, which we believe are now black and white. Well, and let me come out of the world of social science, because I taught social science for a lot of years, more years than I want to talk about. But social science, many people in the world of social science will say, here's a problem. Let's, let's uh, do a study to show why this problem exists. And they don't really use a lot of empirical evidence. They're not physicists in your situation. But let's say, here's what's happened since 1992 that this administration has taken in before General McCafferty, and I have to tell my friend from Maryland, I have a great deal of respect for, for General McCafferty, who came out as a four-star general, uh, commanded the Southern Command, knows about drug interdiction, but even before he became the drug czar, there was $500 million that was taken out of interdiction. There was, uh, uh, 200 uh, million that came out of uh, the ability for us uh, to be able to even interdict, go out and uh, have the Coast Guard planes and the trains and. Gentlemen, just for a second. Yes. Drastically cutting and gutting the drug czar's office so that the, whoever the drug czar is, it doesn't have the resources to do a program. One of the things that I, I find somewhat repulsive, and I think the gentleman from Maryland will probably agree with me, is that when the White House said, well, we cut White House staff, they did. They cut everybody in the drug office. Uh, so that was how we could cut White House staff. But let me get, make an important point before my time's up. That the Coast Guard had $400 million taken out of its budget. These were the people who were successful before 1993 in stopping uh, narcotic air traffic and narcotic traffic coming through boats, uh, through our Mediterranean, uh, Medi Caribbean and in some cases the uh, western, uh, near western Pacific, I'm sorry, eastern Pacific, which is along our, our western coast, and Mexico's western coast. We had $300 million from 1993 to 1996 taken out of source country interdiction. The very thing that I was saying that shows some uh, uh, really correlations between the study you did and the study uh, and, and the results of what happens on the street. And a uh, billion dollars of that money, that savings, went into treatment. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with treatment, but I think you're putting the cart before the horse, quite frankly. When you say we have to put a billion dollars more in treatment, we're going to take it out of drug interdiction and source country uh, actions because we have lowered the price of drugs on the street and we got a lot more kids being hooked on drugs because of the low prices and increased uh, purity. And because of the drug actions that we've had in this country over the last four years, that we have to put another billion dollars in interdiction or in, in drug treatment because we have a lot more kids hooked. 
I think really is a, is a turning the world upside down or putting logic on its head, if you will. What we've tried to do is take some of that money and put at least $200 million more in, into the drug uh, interdiction of the Coast Guard. We've tried to uh, give uh, uh, some of this money into uh, General McCafferty. We've given him $60, 60 million dollars to use at his discretion. Now we want to know how he's going to use it, but so that he can do a better job. And so the science that you've created and the study that you've created that shows that there's a correlation between shutting down drug uh, interdiction in foreign source countries, Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, and what happens on the street is pretty relevant, especially because if we have to spend an extra billion dollars in treatment because those kids that got hooked on the street because you took that drug interdiction money away. And when I go to the chairman, subcommittee chairman on transportation, and say we have to help the Coast Guard stop this drug stuff, we have to squeeze down the pipeline, and he waves the RAND study in my face, then we need to be able to counter that study. And that's exactly what we've done. And if we play ignorance and say, well, we can't do this because we don't see it, then there's something wrong in the system. And I can tell you, it can all be kind of all kinds of models to put in the RAND study, but the RAND study doesn't wash as far as I'm concerned. And the cause and effect that you've put together does wash. There's relevance and some kind of a, a correlation between facts, factual information. That's what we want to see. And, you know, I, I don't know. There's figurative language and there's literal language. And as you, uh, again, my good friend from uh, Maryland said that we, somebody said in that car on the way to the Pentagon that uh, General McCafferty put somebody up against the wall. Uh, that's military language. I know that. Uh, it could be literally against the wall. It could be figuratively against the wall. And uh, as a new drug czar, he may have reason to try to get his feet on the ground and find out what's fact and fiction. But in the long run, we need to be able to give the American people the right information. We need to have Congress and all those people out there who are fighting that drug war to have the right information so they can do the right things. And I think your study, in my opinion, as an economist who sometimes makes mistakes, uh, it goes a long way towards that. I yield back. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, Mr. Uh, Rivolo, um, did you write a memo to certain individuals explaining the White House mindset or the drug czar's office mindset against uh, release of uh, the report? I, I wrote a memo uh, to my boss at IDA who appended it to his own version of the memo, which essentially um, came to the defense of the criticism that came from ONDCP. And the memo essentially said that uh, the work is sound, it needs to be debated in open community, not by the, uh, the, the experts of ONDCP, and that the consequences of this are important enough that you need to open up the machinery. And I, I was did you, critical in my language. Did you uh, provide that uh, memo to Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Brian Sheridan? That memo was delivered to Mr. Sheridan, that is correct. And um, do you have a copy of that memo? I've asked for a copy of that memo, and I haven't gotten a copy of the memo. Uh, I have a copy of the of memo. It actually went to Mr. Newberry, who was in that office. Could you provide a copy of the memo uh, to, this, to the committee? Uh, certainly can. Um, but that memo uh, to Mr. Newberry, behind it is a memo from me to Mr. Tom Christie, my uh, direct supervisor. Well, when you uh, read the memo uh, from Barry Crane to Brian Sheridan through Tom Christie seeking to get this report released and disseminated, given the urgency of the uh, na nation's uh, uh, drug problem, did there com com come a time when you thought uh, you should uh, uh, reveal this information? A reveal to whom? Well, to anyone. To uh, 
uh, I believe that the information should have been made public, yes. And I push that point of view very strongly to Mr. Sheridan and his staff. Well, do you also recall a memo written from within the administration back in 94 or 95, uh, which was a direct indictment of the RAND study promoting treatment, th this, which was a study uh, commissioned by the White House? Do, do you by uh, chance have a copy of that internal critique of the uh, RAND study with you? Um, that was not a memo. It was a draft paper which was done at the request of Mr. Sheridan. It was written by me, uh, delivered to Mr. Sheridan, not in a memo form, but as a draft document. Uh, I have a computer version of that. It's all I can find. Could you provide a copy of that to I the certainly committee? Can. And are you aware that Congress has never received those documents from Sheridan, uh, McCaffrey, Kramick, or any other office from whom we've requested them? No, I was not aware of that. Let me ask you, um, were you ever involved in a conversation with Barry Crane, uh, and did he uh, ever say to you that he was afraid that someone was trying to bury this report? Uh, were shortly you? after the events of the, uh, the attempted briefing, which, was, as I said, lasted for about two days, uh, Dr. Crane was, was upset and essentially made the remark that this is the absolute wrong thing to do uh, because it will look like a cover-up. Dr. Uh, Crane, is that what you said? Uh, I don't recall exactly that language. Did you, did you say someone is trying to bury this uh, report or cover-up? Uh, that language. Uh, let me say, though, that I was upset at that time. What I did was is immediately seek clarification, see if there's any evidence of any of our but, material. Was and Barry, I couldn't find that. Was uh, Barry, or um, Mr. Comfort, were you aware of any of this conversation? Again, as I say, I wasn't there. I, I'd say that both of these briefers came back. They certainly were upset at the time. Uh, I think that they felt they had done good work. I believe we did, had done good work. Uh, I would not be at all surprised, though I do not recall any of that exact language, that that was their, did, feel, their feeling at the time. Did you hear anyone say that uh, McCaffrey had told Kramick that, quote, not a word of this is to get out? Again, I could not recall any specific language at the time, but I believe that kind of feeling, which clearly was conjecture since none of us were in the room, uh, might well have been spoken. And, and you was, never heard and, a comment? Might you have expressed their feelings at the time. You never heard that uh, comment. I can't recall that I've ever heard those specific words. I, I will say, as Dr. Rivolo just mentioned, that I have heard Dr. Crane, just in our standing around the, the coffee pot, so to speak, suggest that he thought it was a mistake that our paper not be given more open dis discussion because he was concerned it would look like somebody was trying to bury our paper. So that was the, the, the comment that you made. I recall that, that sort of conversation. Uh, Mr. Ravello, um, General McCaffrey testified before me when I asked him about this before that your report was, quote, utter nonsense, contained utter nonsense. Did uh, you brief the general prior to, uh, at any time prior to the March uh, meeting that you went to? No, sir. Uh, are you aware that the, ge the general had a copy of the, uh, did he have a copy of the report? He had a copy of the report and the annotated briefing, yes, sir. When was that given to him? Uh, the day of the interagency meeting, which I believe was the 7th of uh, May. 8th, 8th, 8th of May. May. 8th of May. But I'm talking about in March, he told me when he got the report that it was utter nonsense. I, I don't we didn't give anything to him until the 8th of May. Is there anything in the report that it, uh, either in the March version or the May version that's utter nonsense? No, sir. Is there anything in this report in the March version, and I don't have a copy of it, we'll get a copy of it, or the May version that's utter nonsense? In my opinion, uh, no, but we can Mr. Com Dr. Comfort, do you, is there anything in this report in any version, March, May, June, July, 
any copy that hasn't been released that's utter nonsense, that you would term utter nonsense? There is one figure that is subject to misinterpretation. There is nothing that is utter nonsense. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Uh, gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Klinger. Thank you for your testimony here today. I think that the, uh, uh, as I represent a district that has probably more federal prisons than any other district in the country, uh, Lewisburg and Bradford and all over. And as I meet with the, with the wardens of those prisons, the, the thing that comes through so loud and clear is that the major crime problem in this country is a drug problem, that uh, 80 to 90 percent of the prisoners who are incarcerated now are there because of either direct or indirect uh, uh, drug connections, uh, crimes committed because of drugs, crimes committed with drugs directly. So it, it's a, it's a enormous. Uh, I think we we tend to underestimate the cost, the social cost of this problem, and therefore that's why it becomes so absolutely critical that we don't waste resources, that we use the resources in a in a wise and sensible way, an effective way, to address the problem. And we have you know the graph graphs would suggest that we're losing the war, that we are in fact going backwards, so it becomes all the more imperative and all the more urgent uh, that we have clear, precise, accurate information on which to base judgments. That's our job up here. Our job in this committee, the job of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, is to conduct oversight, and that's, a, that's a, an exercise that is often sort of uh, scoffed at. It's an exercise that is often perceived as just political witch hunting, uh, as something that uh, that is uh, that you have to put up with in the in the uh, legislative process, but it's uh, it's really just window dressing. I don't, and I I know no, no member of this committee views our role as just window dressing. We really view it as something that is of vital importance, and I think nothing could could uh, emphasize that more than the the nature of this problem and uh, the reason we're here today. I mean, we feel very strongly that in order to make sensible decisions and to make recommendations to our colleagues on on the results of oversight and what that oversight has produced, we have to have accurate information. If we don't have all the information, then that, that judgment and that, uh, that recommendation is going to be flawed. And in this case, we clearly didn't have all the information at a time when it would have been very helpful to have that information. In other words, when we're really talking about where we put our money, where do we put the bucks, where are they going to be most effectively used? And, and there has been a, you know, the policy has been to put that emphasis on remediation, to put it on on, uh, on uh, treatment, and rather than on interdiction, on the on the what appears to be flawed grounds that that was uh, that that was a failed policy, that interdiction was not working. Uh, so I guess the uh, the concern we have uh, is that we we need to have that information now. You know, we've seen too often here that this. That's why we need to get to the bottom of was this suppressed? Was it deliberately suppressed? Was there a conscious effort to withhold that information because it undercut a policy, or was there some other reason why it was uh, why it was withheld? You know, maybe it uh, maybe it is flawed. You gentlemen stand behind it. I mean, you said that there was certainly no nonsense to this report. That it's uh, that it's scientifically strong and scientifically uh, can, you can back it up. So in, in that case, we do have two conflicting views as to where we ought to be going with this thing. We can't make a judgment unless we have both those views before us, and we did not have your view. We did not have your, uh, your very uh, studied scientific ob objective, we believe, uh, consideration of this whole problem. Uh, so, and you know, we've also, most recently we now have a claim of executive privilege over documents that also might be helpful to us in making that assessment. I believe, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we, we had a uh, memo from, uh, so this is a letter to Mr. Quinn from, uh, I mean, to Mr. Chairman Zella from Mr. Quinn, in which he claims executive privilege over a, uh, a document that might be very helpful to our to our examination. Uh, so I guess my my question to you, a couple of questions. Uh, number one, uh, some confusion over whether what what the status of this report is. We had a March version, a May version, various other versions. Did you consider this work product a final? final report? Uh, what I'd like to do as a project leader go through the sequence of how we produce a substantive report. Uh, at the stage of May 8th, we were going to have some comment from interagency and we were releasing it from the inside group. Uh, that process went on. 
We, we, it went into government hands, and we know this distribution was made. Now, the, what we would do is get these uh, comments back. I have a very substantial uh, uh, comment file. We got the comments back. We're addressing you know, the criticisms. Now, those criticisms are very, very valuable to scientists because they improve not only our ability to, expo you know, to, to make our case, but they also expose any weaknesses in our logic. So w we are also, because this became uh, quite a controversial issue, uh, I, uh, on August 30th I received a list of distinguished people from the National Research Council so that we could uh, provide them to do much uh, higher level review of not only our own documents, but also uh, the ones that uh, we have difference in findings. So it's our intention to go through the formal uh, review process to, in, to make a report, and we're just along that process. And what's happened here is we've stumbled into the middle of, of, of the scientific debate. And let me, let me interrupt you here, Dr. Fink, because my time yes, is running out. Yes, just to reference a, a memo that you, that you did send to uh, Brian Sheridan in July, yes, in which you said the failure to disseminate and use these new research results, assuming, assumingly what we're talking about here, optimally in employing and motivating the limited allied forces may put in jeopardy future source zone performance against cocaine production. So you felt in July that this was, let me was a matter say of that, some urgency. Let me say, uh, to put in context, this report is only one of maybe 20 things we work on. My principal support to Admiral Kramick and, Sher and Brian Sheridan is to uh, provide operational advice. This report is, I didn't mention the word report in there at all other than there were some criticisms of it. Uh, there is ongoing operations, sir, right now that I needed to put certain types of this information. I wanted to be absolutely sure it had to get out. And in, and in fact, all the recommendations in there have been complied with. We have brief senior people at the conference in August. So I am satisfied that that's happened. Mr. Chairman, I have just one further question, <clears throat> if I may. Uh, Dr. Ravolo, you answered uh, earlier, and I was not here when you did, to uh, Congressman Cummings' question that you didn't have any direct evidence that General McCaffrey was directing this report be quashed. And, and, uh, however, I think you intimated, intimated that the ONDCP staff, staff may have tried to influence uh, this report in some way that you felt you, you had some intimations or some suggestions that there may have been staff influence. Could you elaborate and do you have any specific uh, uh, yeah, and as I said, this was uh, many, many months uh, before General McCaffrey actually took that office. We had findings and we were briefing uh, the interagencies as early as March of 1995 that there was some significant connection between the interdiction events and what was happening in the streets. We felt this was important and new because it contradicted the, uh, the standard view of things and we tried to bring that into ONDCP. And we tried many times. We, did, we had uh, Mr. Sheridan attempted. We had his uh, staff attempted. Um, we also, for many months, requested data, uh, uh, Department of Justice data, Health and Human Services data, and all of that had to be approved through ONDCP. And those things did not happen. They happened extremely slowly, or they did not happen at all. So it, it was our view, I should say my view, maybe my colleagues, because I was working very closely with the people who handled the data, that the, uh, that, that office was not interested in listening to what we had to say. That was my perception, and I hold it to this day. This is, uh, that's what I believe. So it, it went beyond just bureaucratic lethargy or, or uh, you know, the bureaucratic slowdown yes. that occurred. Yes. It went beyond yes. that. To yes, a that's, that's my perception. Really. Thank you. I just have a quick uh, question here. The, you all referred to a secret report, a briefing that was uh, apparently given to certain members of the administration uh, as an addendum to one of the reports that we have here. Is this correct? And uh, we were wondering if we could get a copy of that secret report. Uh, are you, could you give us the uh, a date? I mean, you mean the day of this report? Is that what you're referring to? I, I believe, Dr. Crane, you referred to the secret report. So it's something you have and we don't have. And if you could give me the date, that's the one we want. Okay. Uh, th there was a secret report, uh, that we, th the briefing materials that we had, and uh, we could provide that to you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I guess the only last comment I'd make is, is that the report that you all are working on took 18 months. It was presented initially in March. It's now, you know, March, April, May, June, July, August. We're in September, October. Um, you know, it wasn't buried, it wasn't delayed, it wasn't suppressed, it wasn't, I don't know, what, what was it? Why, 
when, when does it get done and at what point does it have any relevant value? We, and again, General McCaffrey came in here and got sworn in on September, in, in February and I attended that swearing in ceremony. Uh, so we're not criticizing him, we're criticizing bad data that basically he will then use to come up with 1996 programs, 1997 appropriations. So when, in the year 2000, when, when will this thing be done? And, and, and admittedly, it wasn't buried or delayed. Um, I want to again put in context that we do a lot of work. Um, we have limitations at accelerating that work. Uh, we, as you know, uh, the FFRDCs are restricted from, uh, uh, I can't hire more people because of ceilings on us and so on. But uh, to, to be fair, we have made uh, uh, many reports at the secret level about this material uh, to the interagency, and that is the proper forum. Uh, you will see as you go back, this, this is just one little piece of it. The, the principal uh, communication that we make is to the forces and assessment of how they perform. And we use this material where we could to improve their uh, performance. And those, I think, are all a matter for the record and exist. Dr. Crane, you don't feel it's been delayed? Um, now that I have a chance to, to look back on uh, all of the questions to make our case, I, I feel it's, it's, it's certainly appropriate uh, that we take a lot of caution. Uh, we, we, we're going so to write. I don't feel it's been delayed. This is normal. I, I, I don't think uh, if we answer the thing correctly, I don't feel that that, that report, because it's only one of about three or four things. Sir, having Doc seen a lot, of, a lot of documents go forward. Uh, certainly, in our view, when we sent forward a final draft report, a final draft document, uh, and let me note that the document makes very clear on the inside cover that we issue it as a document because it is preliminary and tentative analyses. We felt at that time that that document was ready for open discussion in the scientific community. We believe that we've since that time been working the best we could to respond to valuable criticisms. We think we're pretty close to getting all of those understood and responded to. It's been going slower than any of us would like it to happen. Dr. It's not typical. Uh, I believe that any time that a document comes out of IDA and is controversial, it does take a long time. So, so seven months on top of 18 is not a big deal? Uh, I think the document is irrelevant. I think the information should have been disseminated for open discussion way before that, yes. So in your, is that, can I use the word delayed? Um, well, what would you use? I mean, I, I've just, you know, I, I in, haven't been around. In a, in a normal environment, the promulgation of information is immediate. Someone says something, it's put on a table and debated, and if it's junk, it's sh very quickly shown to be junk. If it's substantial, it's very quickly shown to be so. So what word would you, what word would you use? My word would be that the document itself is probably on course. That's that, a controversial document, it's not being delayed. The information it's clearly been delayed. Okay, the information in the document has been delayed, but the document itself is on course. That, that's good enough for government work. <laughs> um, let me just ask you one comment. Dr. Crane, in your memo of July, and I just referred to you, these findings once again, and on page three down the bottom, deserve attention at the highest levels. The failure to advocate, support these findings, potentially jeopardize future effectiveness. Do you remember that? On that, uh, uh, is as everyone who knows me in the previous, at the beginning of the Airbridge operations, I certainly made s uh, similar type arguments at the critical times of operations, and it, we have another operation which I don't want to get into at, at the hearing here, but this was a critical operational time, and I will tell you that after giving that document to Mr. Sheridan and Admiral Kramick that within a week or two, uh, action was taken, and I did get a chance in an open session to brief the Deputy Director of Supply Reduction at the interagency, and we went over a lot of this information. So from my point of view, uh, it achieved its uh, purpose is to advise Admiral Kramick to, to act, and in fact, that happened. But, but the Oversight Committee doesn't have a right to participate in this process. Uh, sir, I uh, uh, do not work for the Oversight Committee, and uh, you would have to speak with Admiral Kramick about what information he makes available to you. Okay. Well, we'll uh, ask that of others <coughs> that have yet to testify. Mr. Cummings. I assume. Sure, I assume. Uh, I'm uh, no. uh, uh, this additional Very questions. Well. Well, let me, Take let as me many as you need. Let me ask you. Yes, I, I do then. Um, tell me something. When, um, it's my understanding that DOD sent, sent a grant 
report to the National Research Council for review. And has the National Research Council reviewed your draft? And if so, can you provide uh, the subcommittee with a copy of that review? Uh, let me comment on that. Uh, we're going through the process to do that. Uh, I received uh, a, a list of potential reviewers. Uh, they took a, a brief look at it. We do not have any review from the NRC in our hand. Uh, that is something that, that we will do as part of making an Ida paper out of it, an outside independent authority, and we're just setting up that process now. Okay, so how long do you think that'll take? Uh, the chairman is, uh, and rightfully so, is very concerned about this report getting out, and, and I think everybody here shares that, uh, that we want to see the final report. Uh, when do you think all of that will be complete? And is that the last stage? I mean, is there still more after that? Uh, no, I think we have a lot of comments to, to put in there and put clarifications, and we certainly will do that where there was confusion. Um, just giving a ballpark figure. A ballpark figure. I think in the next next uh, a few months, we'll, we'll have to look at. It. I'll have to go back and take a look at what manpower is available and what ongoing operations. And then obviously, uh, there's a lot more priority in this document than there was say a week ago. So I, I'll have to give that some more thought. <laughs> You, oh, you, oh, okay. You, so you, a week ago, it wasn't that much of a priority, you don't think? Well, I think there was some priority, but, but clearly, I mean, we were making information available to the, I was, uh, when this all broke loose, I was in Panama with the uh, uh, operational commanders, and we're still giving them the information they need to run their operations that we know of. So I, uh, you know, that was my first priority. And to be honest with you, I think uh, to get this out, or how, uh, I certainly will increase the priority in this area. Mr. Cummings, could I just point out that our draft reports are handled, the, the, the distribution of those belongs to our sponsors. We, we have no problems with that draft final report being distributed if our sponsor chooses to do that. We can crank out a draft, a, a, another report that we believe is final uh, quite rapidly. We've, we've pretty much gone, finished going through the comments as we understand them. Uh, because of all the publicity that this has uh, uh, received in the past few weeks, we th and because we know there is, uh, it's new work, it's pioneering work, and it's received a lot of criticism, we think that a, a review by something like the National Research Council might be worthwhile. If, that, if our sponsor wants to conduct that, if he wants us on our own to conduct that, uh, we can certainly do that. But we, we would, on our own, certainly not tell you that we can't get a little report before another two or three months. Okay, so, so therefore, we will probably have a report within I would, I would feel comfortable that we could have a report uh, out to our sponsor in the next three to four weeks. Very well. Whether or not our sponsor, how our sponsor wants to distribute it is up sure. to our sponsor. Thank you. On the, um, what do you think of the peer review comments obtained by ONDCP? I'm just curious. What did you think of them? Uh, I'll, I'll first comment. I think because this is new work, this, is, this type of thing is not un, uncommon to, the, to my past experience. They have a lot of debate since it's... We have a lot of data that they have not seen. They saw only one graph out of, say, 10,000 of them. We have a tremendous amount of data. We really need to sit down and have an open forum on this to rapidly come to convergence. But we have a lot of data uh, that we, we could put in there and support our position. And I think it really comes down to, uh, 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 from my understanding, a view of how the system worked and uh, a conventional view. And, this, and the data we have, we, we just can't make the two match up. The data says it's working a different way, and when we're uh, uh, physical scientists, and we have to go with the data. We made no a priori assumptions about how the, it was a retail wholesale market, and we made uh, no a priori assumptions about what type of model we first, and what we've been reporting really is the raw data, not even a model yet. I would also say, Mr. Cummings, that uh, it's clear to us in hindsight that we, in several cases, uh, we're unsophisticated in our choice of some terms that are well defined in the e economics community and we use them to mean similar but not exactly the same things and we were taken severely to task for that. Somebody said that uh, back there when this uh, report was uh, initially presented to Mr. Caffrey that um, you all thought some other people were in the room. So, who said that? I don't remember. Did, uh, um, bring them up for uh, questioning. I'm just... The person is uh, Captain Boyer, if in fact he was there. I, I was not, but consequent conversation with my colleagues seems to indicate that Captain Boyer may have been present in that meeting. Can you explain, can any of you explain, um, if your pre-1989 data were adjusted to take into account the interdiction policies prior to 1989? Uh, we we have since looked at that data. 
Uh, that was actually a valuable criticism, and uh, we were able to measure certain things about operations that DEA ran against the Tranquilandia complex. Um, uh, we did. We have taken that since uh, we received criticism in that area. Well, I'm running out of time, but I just want to thank you. I think this is our last round, but I want to thank you all uh, for sharing this information. I certainly look forward to reading the final draft. I think that we are all uh, concerned about what we're this. Uh, what we're trying to address here, and that is drug addiction and deaths and crime that come from it. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all. And I really appreciate uh, your candor. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Hassett. To clarify one of the questions that my good friend from Maryland asked. Prior to eight, 1989, 86, 87, uh, cocaine was just really coming on the scene, wasn't it? it wasn't that something relatively new? It was kind of replacing heroin as the... No, sir. No, sir. Uh, the cocaine uh, epidemic peaked around 1984. All right. The demand has been declining ever since. Since that time. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, before you got here and you knew you were going to come, are you, uh, Mr. Rivolo, are you aware that meetings or conversations occurred throughout the past weekend and even yesterday among those who would testify today? Are you aware of those? No, sir. So there are no uh, meetings or anything that uh, people wanted to talk together and make sure that they got all you the You mean within the company? Yes. Oh, there were meetings between the three of us. Um, Anybody else? Uh, we had a short meeting with the president. With the president? Yes, sir. Uh, like a president United? of the company, that is. Oh, of the company. All right. <laughs> wow. That was be well, I would say that that would be uh, interesting. <clears throat> Uh, so you know of no other meetings that took place this weekend? Uh, no, sir. In fact, I was away on unrelated business uh, having to do with uh, radars. Uh, I just came back on Sunday. Thank you. Um, let me also ask uh, Mr. Crane. Uh, one of the questions here from my friend from the other side of the aisle is that you never actually briefed uh, General McCaffrey. And you said, no, you never did talk to General McCaffrey. Matter of fact, uh, like uh, Mr. Comfort, you said you've never met General McCaffrey. Uh, part of the reason is because you were, didn't brief him on that day that you went to brief him. Is that correct? Uh, Dr. Comfort didn't. Just Dr. Vole and I attended the meetings right. that day. Dr. Comfort did not attend. But you attended the meeting, but you never were there, finished the purpose for which you went. Is that correct? That was to brief General McCaffrey? Uh, the, the way it went that day is I'm we just asking. You went to brief him that day. Yes. Admiral Kramick went in before you, yes. took some of your information, and came out and said the briefing would not be necessary. Is that basically what I, happened? I recall it, the, the words I recall is he did not take the briefing, which is a standard thing for some reason that he wasn't going to accept okay. the briefing from us, and that's the way I took it. So then you never did have a chance to, to brief him. I mean, that, uh, that no, sir, discussion, so people could ask questions like we asked today actually never took place. Mr. Rivolo, is that correct? Dr. Crane, is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, go back and, and ask here. Uh, there was a draft paper on source zone interdiction effectiveness and uh, called an excellent step court quantifying a very complex issue. Uh, one of the things that had the empirical examination of counter drug interdiction program effectiveness, that was in your report, was it not? In your original draft? I'm not sure I understand what your question is, sir. The information on source zone interdiction effectiveness was in your original draft, was it not? Or one of your original drafts, uh, Dr. Comfort? Yes, uh, all of our drafts of this paper have always contain the same basic information on right. source, source zone effectiveness. Then was there or was there not a recommendation deleting or softening any language that appears to be either combative or condescending to the RAND study or self-promoting of the IDA study instead of taking a negative approach toward the uh, RAND analysis? Uh, do you know if there was any suggestion to soften that language the, or to change that language? It, it's, there were clearly recommendations where we might have used phraseology in a previous study or something like that, and, uh, and people make recommendations to us. I don't believe we softened any of our findings. Uh, we might have done a better job. 
it, Where did that recommendation come from? Do you recall? Uh, as, as I recall, um, uh, the USIC might have made that recommendation, but I don't have the paper. But uh, his staff, however, uh, again, uh, you can clearly see we didn't, we didn't change any of our conclusions or anything like that. In fact, all the Mr. Rivolo, did you recall any pressure to change any language or softening uh, no, any language? No, the, uh, the suggestion, uh, let me relate events that when I was asked to do the initial analysis of the RAND report, the first RAND report, which is uh, modeling the demand for cocaine, which feeds the second report, which is the one that's always being discussed. When I made that analysis, I wrote up a very technical detail of who did what and what was done wrong and what was done right. That document was then turned over internally, in, specifically to Dr. Comfort, who ultimately wrote most of the document. He acted as the redactor, as that word uh, is used. Um, and in the process, it was his feeling that my technical critique was much too critical for open discussion. And, and I agreed with it because that was never meant to be a standalone document. The draft of that document was never meant to go through the IDA process. It went directly to Mr. Sheridan's office. That document was then incorporated in large part in an appendix of the document that we are now discussing. And the discussion about the terms and the language was strictly internal, mostly from uh, Dr. Comfort. Well, basically there were nine pages on flaws in the treatment study, the RAND study, in your study. And somebody asked to get it out. Is that right or is that wrong? Um, I, 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 my, a simple answer. No, I don't know. Uh, the answer is that what I did was so to analyze the first paper, which did nothing addressing the effectiveness of treatment. The first paper is strictly modeling the demand for cocaine. My analysis says there's a serious problem here. When the actual document was written to incorporate the second document, of which Dr. Comfort uh, did most of the work, um, there may have been some discussion. We were discussing it last night or this morning that perhaps at some point someone said maybe you shouldn't be so critical of that. But it, it was, did, did not apply to me directly. that someone might have been? Let me make it clear, as the project leader, I said I made the following decisions. I thought just putting out a very detailed critique of someone else's work is probably not the best. What we waited for before we published the report is we had hard data from events that we, uh, I don't want to use the prediction here, because, but we pretty well analyzed what were going to happen. And it was much more important to make our case from hard data. And I made the decision myself not to put out just a detailed critique, because that's not, uh, I think that wasn't uh, appropriate. Let me finally ask this one question, this final question, my right, time's running out to all three of you. In your report or draft or final draft, anything that hasn't been made public, uh, and it does really uh, reflect on future policy and what we do in this country towards how we treat the drug problem that we have, did you do you stand by the information and the cause and effect information that you've published in, in this draft or you've put out in this draft? In fact, if you can choke down in some type of uh, major events, either in the transportation or the pipeline for drugs or do away with major production uh, of those drugs in countries like Peru and Colombia, that you can affect the cost of drugs in the market and the purity of drugs in the market. Absolutely. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Micah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, or Dr. Crane, did you or uh, Rex uh, Rivolo receive a men memo from Admiral Kramick's top assistant, uh, Gary Boyer, in April of this year before the May, May quote, uh, final uh, draft was complete, stating that you should remove the conclusions in your report that were critical of the administration's heavy emphasis on drug treatment's effectiveness, specifically that you should remove your criticism of, criticism of the administration commission ran study that promoted treatment. I, I received the memo. We had discussions about it, and we didn't obviously remove that material. Did said, uh, I served as the redactor for this final draft. Uh, I believe I was the person who was deciding primarily how to say it, what did words you, to put in. 
if that such a memo existed, I did, was not aware of it. I certainly had my own concerns as to how much emphasis we place on the RAND report because we didn't want our primary findings confused with our secondary findings. Are you aware of but the existence? I felt no, no Dr. pressure to do anything. Dr. Crane, have you, are you aware of the existence of such a memo? I, uh, I recall a memo uh, from, from, from uh, Admiral Kramick's office giving yes. some suggestive guidance. Uh, I, I wouldn't have characterized it. Do you have a copy of that memo? I do not. I do not at this time have a copy of it. Dr. Rivolo, are I've you never aware of that memo? Uh, only through discussions with uh, my colleagues, I have never seen the memo. I have a copy now uh, which you provided me of this July response to the uh, drug czar's uh, comments on your draft uh, to uh, Robert Newberry, Office of Secretary of Defense. And in this, in your defense, uh, uh, while they were trying to study this uh, report to death here, uh, I want to read from page three. It says, although it's true that many of the databases are very convoluted and contain many sources of possible confounding information, we have developed empiri empirical evidence, not model results, for negative correlation between price and demand measured both by prevalence and consumption and no fewer than six totally independent uh, data sets. These indi indicators incl uh, include one, and these are uh, six different, uh, the, the Drug Abuse uh, Warning Network, DAWN, which we're all familiar with, the Drug Usage Forecast uh, Database, the, the Treatment Episode Database, uh, the Smith-Klein Beecham Clinical Laboratories t uh, Drug Testing Database, the Uniform Crime Reporting Database, the National Household Survey on Drug uh, Abuse uh, uh, Database. Uh, would you say, and I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm not a scientist, but would you say, uh, Dr. Ravello, that uh, this is pretty good confirmation of, of uh, your conclusions? Uh, yes, sir. In fact, uh, when we first saw the first inkling, which came out of the uh, Dawn data, the, uh, there was severe criticism that it was a coincidence, that the correlations were there, but it was just a coincidence. Now, I see in the concluding remarks that were prepared that they, that you suggest uh, that one, the long sought interchange meeting with the uh, drug czar's office scientists may uh, be made to happen. Was there a delay in those uh, meetings? As I've, uh, alluded to before that for many months prior to the news are taking his position that we had made uh, many, many repeated, attempts. Repeated attempts. Um, that an open, this is another recommendation, that an open conference on the issues be sponsored jointly by DOD and the Drug Czar's office uh, to be held in the very near future. Was that done? No, sir. This is in July. Third, that uh, unbiased, competent authorities such as the National Research, Research Council be jointly recruited to shed light on issues. Was that done? No, sir. We're, we're in the process of doing that, to be fair, though. I do Here, have a, a list uh, of NRC and people. And that will come out maybe in November or December well, when it, the report it, it, comes out? It's the NRC uh, that was pretty slow, not, I mean, it, it took several months. But we haven't worked those issues we, out yet. Yeah, we'll have to study it some more. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a, a many additional questions, several pages, and I'd ask unanimous consent or uh, consent permission that uh, they be submitted to these witnesses and that they be allowed to respond uh, and that be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Klinger. Okay, I guess uh, I just have one or two here. Um, and. Uh, Dr. Rivolo, uh, there's one thing that's bothering me, and it, and it keeps nagging at me a little bit. Did I hear you say that you heard not a word of this is to get out? Yes, sir. Once the, uh, the, uh, the staff vehicle ride back to the Pentagon, that was my understanding that until further notice, none of this is to get out. Yes. Okay. That's not being suppressed or not being delayed or not being buried. Just just the word is it, not... It, it was not a directive, uh, but it was said. Okay. And in fact, we canceled the, uh, the briefing for the following day. I guess that, that 
my summation of this is that, that uh, we're all here and uh, my, my friend Mr. Cummings on many occasions has talked about the drug situation in Baltimore. Uh, I represent New Hampshire. We've done operations in Operation Street Sweeper in Manchester has been very effective. We're doing stuff in Nashua and, and small towns. Uh, we've been with the Coast Guard uh, in transit zone. We've been source country programs. Uh, we've worked very, very hard uh, to put together the, the appropriate response to the administration's request. Admittedly, um, we, I think, did everything and more for Barry McCaffrey in terms of his office, to not only the staffing of his office, but the, the, the appropriate resources that, that, uh, that the administration feels they need. And uh, certainly in terms of cooperation, I think that we've been there and done it. And uh, my concern is I have three grandchildren uh, that I'm worried about. All of us have our kids that we worry about, and this is an epi epidemic. Um, drug use, all ages, all drugs are out of control. Um, and in particular, the most recent data that we had a hearing on last week, uh, where uh, teenage drug use is, is out of control. Um, and, and I think that the only problem that I have with this, or the major problem that I have with this thing, is this information was given to us in a timely manner. We could have affected some possible changes in the 1996 report. We could have affected changes in 1997 appropriations. And uh, when kids are dying on the streets, you know, we don't have a year to waste. And so I think the responsibility somewhere along the line has to be shared by all of us. All of us that allowed that to happen, you all for allowing it to happen. Uh, well, uh, I mean, we've had a good discussion here for two hours. Uh, hopefully we'll hear some more with some additional panels. But I think it's an absolute tragedy that we allowed another year to go by if, in fact, your, your data is good. If it's good and hard research and it's the right data and it survives uh, the daylight of being the right data, then we should have had that information. We shouldn't be... Uh, messing around, waiting for six more revisions so that it, it gets the right words. I mean, I think the, the, everybody said that, look, beyond the, the, the minor changes uh, or whatever kind of changes you've been making in, in all these drafts, the substance of the report still stands, and you're proud of it. Am I, am I right in that, Dr. Crane? Am I right? And so it's unfortunate that we don't have that data as an oversight subcommittee here as we who committed to the drug czar's office and to the president to give them the resources they need to fight the war on drugs. Um, because it is, it's an issue that affects all Americans. It's, a, it's the most important serious issue that we face in this country today. And you combine drugs and crime together, I don't know of anything more important that we need to fight. We need all the information we get so we make the right decisions. And so um, on behalf of all of us, and I don't think there's anybody here that's not part of this, and, and, and those of us that couldn't be here today, uh, we thank you for, for, for being here. And um, we may have not used the right words or somehow, but I think the consensus here is, is that we need the information in that report as soon as we can get it. We need to be able to evaluate it. And if it's correct, we need to make some the, the appropriate changes in our strategy. Thank you all very much for being here. Take a uh, five-minute recess uh, while we wait uh, General McCaffrey and the next panel. Turn to more of this hearing on the Clinton administration's drug control policy after this programming note. Later on Washington Journal, our guests include Stephen Erlanger, the chief diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times, and Russ Verney, national coordinator for the Reform Party. Washington Journal.